Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Crenitia, fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. Welcome to the Dr. Finance Live podcast. We got an incredible guest today, folks. We got Richard Dolan here. Richard Dolan is uh, a, f- a very good friend of C-Rock, his mentor, and uh, Mike Ciarocco. Ha- he introduced me to, to Richard today. Unbelievably excited to meet him. Richard is an amazing entrepreneur and speaker and so many other things. Just incredible. We, we, I can't even digest him just a little bit. So I just want to I just want to introduce him and then we're going to get a quick snapshot of him and then we'll get into a story. So welcome, Richard. Nice to meet hey, you. So, so, so good to be here, man. I, I don't know if I sh- should be calling you uh, Anthony, doctor, doctor finance, but all of them are true, man. It's, it's great to see you doing great work. It's amazing to see that you've been up to it for uh, the period of time that you have and have achieved the heights of excellence in doing it, man. It just speaks volumes of the kind of man you are, the mission you're on and how aligned you are to both. So, so great to be here. Thank you, Richard. Honored to have you here. Yeah, you can call me Tony. Tony's a short name. Got gotcha, um, you, man. Yeah. The Dr. Finance actually was created for many reasons. One major one was they couldn't pronounce my, my last name when I was a, a professor <laughs> at uh, the university. Well, well, I, was well, I, I, I was born Richard, but I used to be called Dick all the time. So, I mean, I, I got it, man. Sometimes people just want to shorten what your name is because <laughs> it makes it easier for them. So it's all good, Tony, but it's good to be here, man. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. All right, Rich. So, to, uh, in honor to get started, I think the best way to do it because you got an incredible bio. Can we just get like a quick snapshot, maybe thirty seconds or less, to describe your like if you had to auto, audibly, uh, you know, describe your bio, and then we'll get into your story right after that. Hey, man, I, I, I'm I'm grateful for that. I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, that's that's what I really am. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and and I invest the kind of uh, commodity that we've all got uh, the same amount of, and that's time. So over the years, I mean, I was trained in the financial services space as an investment banker. And so I really appreciate our relationship to what it means to pursue more money, more wealth, more worth. Um, But at some particular point, I I mean, I really fell madly in love with the self-help space. And it's likely because in that space, we were really trained and developed to weaponize our salesmanship. So in that in that regard, I really took on a love and moonlighted as an author, a speaker and a trainer uh, simultaneously while really dominating the space in the wealth management world. So I've raised over $8 billion in assets. Uh, I've coached over thousands of financial planners and investment advisors. Uh, I remain an advisor to an incredible iconic brands, celebrities, sports leaders, professionals, C-suite folks. Um, I mean, four US presidents, Oprah, Ellen, uh, I mean, Drake, Mike Tyson, um, just to name a few. And I, as much as that's all very impressive, the best part of my life is uh, being a dad um, and, and, and being really awesome at it. So, I mean, for me, that's, that's really who I am. I'm a serial entrepreneur who's really serious about really getting people's relationship right with money. That is incredible, Richard. Appreciate that, man. And, uh, and I, I like the, the fact that you added the dad part and because family, family does come first and, and that's, um, an incredible part of the life journey to be able to, to take it, to raise a family and, and, and be proud of that. Like there's not, there, believe it or not, there's, there's a lot of people on this planet that aren't. And that's, that's kind of sad. I mean, if we had everyone taking care of their, their kids properly and, and, and it all starts with the village, we'd have yeah, a better no. world. So. And, and not to make this all about parenting, fatherhood, what it means to be a mother or a dad or a child. But I mean, really when it comes to love, family and belonging, we either look at it one of two ways. We, we, we have to do it or we get to do it. And, and every day I wake up and I realize I get to be a dad and, and I generate it new every day. And I don't mind living Groundhog's Day with my son because it just gives me the opportunity every single day to give myself uh, 24 hours less, one minute of being conscious of that to prove I'm the best dad in the world. And, um, and I never want to come and have the final vote be brought in. So I'm, I'm proving it every day. Um, and, and so I just want to make sure I say that to all the fathers and mothers out there. It's, it's truly a blessing to be one. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate that. And, uh, Mothers and Father's Day is coming up pretty soon in this neck of the world. So yeah, so it's apropos. It's apropos that we we, we plant the seed of of gratitude when it comes to celebrating mothers and fathers. So <laughs> that, yeah, it's incredible. Thank you, Rich. All right, Rich. So let's get on to your your story, which is also incredible. So you're you're actually from Toronto, Canada. I love that city. Uh, I'm here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I've been to Toronto, and what an incredible city. Uh, it's just just beautiful place. You have a, so many things here, and you got the best Chinatown on the East Coast. Uh, other than hey, New York. <laughs> won't, won't, won't argue that. And I got to tell you, man, growing, growing, being born and raised in Toronto, my, my father's uh, Ukrainian, my, my mother 
is South American. So I've got good, good skin tone. I got a great liquor tolerance. So I'm the perfect vacation buddy and I never get drunk and I, and I never get burnt. Um, but all kidding aside, I mean, I grew up in a time when Toronto was really, truly a, a melting pot of, of many nations. And during that time, it really kind of lost its identity, given the fact that many people immigrated to the city, Italians, and Portuguese, Greek and Indian, um, Caribbean folk and all kinds of uh, walk of life, all kinds of cultures and faiths and colors. But I mean, it wasn't until probably the past 20, 25 years that Toronto really grew into its own. I mean, as a, as a real dominant force, as a financial economic uh, center of the universe, uh, it's become a real heavyweight in the world of finance, in the world of wealth. Some of the world's largest financial institutions operate out of Toronto and are known even across uh, the United States and around the world, like TD Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, Scotia Bank, to name a few. So, you know, Canada probably became cool. It became cool when Drake was born. I mean, it became cool <laughs> because we're now known as, uh, you know, uh, the Great White North, thanks to the Raptors victory, uh, winning a championship. I mean, we're, we're, we, we here in Toronto are known as uh, the six, right? Or the, or the 416, which is our area code if you were to live in Toronto. So th thanks to Drake and a lot of really cool urbanified, uh, very chill, very cool uh, individuals, leaders, hip hop artists and designers. Um, I mean, D squared came out of Toronto. Uh, you know, Drake and OVO Sound came out of Toronto and uh, The Weeknd came out of Toronto. There, there's so many incredible uh, people, uh, Nelly Furtado and, and, and the list goes on of incredible talents that have come out of Toronto, let alone Canada. So, so being born here though, it's amazing. I was told that I was, uh, you know, born local, but, but, but was built to be global. So a lot of what I do is actually around the world. I spend very little time here at home. I spend very little time here in Toronto. I'm largely uh, in, in different parts of the States, different parts of Europe and different parts of the Middle East uh, doing the kind of work I do. So uh, super grateful for my heritage, super grateful uh, to say A once in a while and, and, and how boot that once in a while um, and ask for a Tim Hortons uh, double double once in a while because that's just part of who we are and uh, I'm grateful and, and super humble to call myself a Canadian. Do you love Toronto? I, I appreciate Toronto. I mean Toronto's grown quite some and I think no different from your city and many really major metropolitan centers uh, when they have a huge influx of people over a long period of time. Um, what I grew up in as Toronto is different from where I now experience Toronto from for two major reasons. One, we have a lot more populace there than ever before. Millions of people have come to my city in the time in which I've lived there. And, and a part of that also too is, is I've changed. A big part of who I am has changed, evolved, transformed if it were. So, so I'll, I'll always have a place in my heart for Toronto, but I think it always comes down to where, where is my life best lived so to be of greatest service to this planet and I don't know if it's going to be Toronto. I'm not quite certain that, that this is going to be the, the final stop on my journey. But if you go to Mars and you take it all the way to the moon and beyond, and you'll still always remember Toronto in your heart, right? Absolutely. I always say that wherever you go, Tony, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so, so it don't matter where, where I'm going to. I know that the number one consistent irrefutable truth is I'll be the same and I'll be the same person I am. So, so absolutely. I mean, look, I love Toronto. Uh, don't get me wrong. It, I think that as, as a result of us having a conversation uh, around finance and around our relationship to money, uh, I think I'm coming from the context of where, where can I really be of greatest service? And, and right now, Toronto doesn't really need my help. Toronto's got its program running pretty good, and it's got its own battle of challenges, political, geopolitical, socioeconomic. Um, but I'm up to a bigger, greater game where people, people don't have access to help. They don't have access to intelligence. They don't have access to your genius podcasts like this and conversations like this one. Um, Toronto needs help, but it's got a lot of great support. So I want to go where I can be used up and people can say, gosh, I'm really glad that that guy became an instrument of impact at the time that he did, because man, we needed to solve that problem. Uh, or else I don't know where we'd be as a people, as a country or as a society. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, Richard. And uh, I, I appreciate you digressing this for a second because I think it's important because the sense that I'm getting from you is that, you know, you, you and we're going to learn your story about Toronto. You have very sim a lot of similarities to me. Um, it's hard to tell our story without telling about the place we came from. Like it's integrated with our life, right? Like when you ask me my story, like I would tell you about Philly. I would describe the environment I grew up in. 
that's important in order to set the stage for how you find out how I became what I became. I think yeah. it's the same way with you, which we're yeah. going to hopefully find out. No, no, you're right. I mean, if anyone's taking note of, of this conversation and taking this as a learning opportunity and making notes, I'd write this word down. And, and that is that we, we really truly do grow from a state of thrownness. And thrownness is like if I were to pick you up, Tony, and throw you into a situation, that is a, that's a context in which you were thrown into, uh, whether it's a bar or a, or, or a school or, or a family. And we were all born into a certain particular thrownness. Uh, it, it, it comes from the DNA, the lineage of where you've come from that's taken thousands of years to, in fact, have you arrive as you are. Uh, number two, it's a big part of just kind of like who the family was. And, and the factors surrounding you from mom, dad, brother, sisters, uh, nephew, nieces, cousins, aunts. Uh, and, then, and then third, and more importantly, the kind of influences that shaped you, the kind of influences that shaped you that would include things like education, things that inspired you, the movies you watched, the people you surrounded yourself by, the education you took after the education you completed, the people you got to call friends, the woman or man that you call now wife or husband, uh, or the, the the kind of life you just live. So the, the culmination of those things really does give shape to the person you are and thus shapes the experience of life you have. If, if you don't take that all into account, so that underscores what you just said, if you don't really once in a while just look back to get a sense of where you've come from, you, you won't really truly appreciate and, and feel so blessed by where you've arrived. And, uh, you know, to quote my dear friend, C-Rock, uh, our friend C-Rock, it, it's, it's kind of like asking that question, what are you made of? And, and what are you made of, which is his real battle cry, if I may say, um, his motto, if it were, his opening line in his podcast, it, it's to really do that. It's to kind of just let's take a look at your history to really appreciate your trajectory. And, and that's a really worthwhile conversation, no matter what age or stage of life you're in. Thank you, Rich. So, Rich, I, um, I like to get to know your story starting from like the early years. But can you paint a picture of, you know, as a follow up to this whole discussion, can you paint a picture of Toronto growing up, the kind of environment you went through? Now, you just like myself, I know you came from a very rough area and a very a lot of struggles and to get where you are. I mean, you're extremely successful, but you, you had tons of battles and a lot of glass ceilings to break. Um, hmm. What what was Toronto like growing up back then? You already mentioned the change population has increased a lot but back you know uh you know when you were growing up was there a lot of people there still like what was the what was the surrounding like if you can paint that maybe a minute or so listen my 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 childhood would probably be no different from anyone else that grew in a you know grew up in a inner city um in in a in a not poor family but likely just maybe just barely above that uh working class family that had its own you know distraught its own distress its own sense of disconnect and discomforts that resulted in a divorce. Uh, so as a young kid being just about five years of age, growing up and through the dynamics that come and unfold when you go through a divorce. And I mean, whether you're in Toronto or, or Philly or New York, Chicago, I mean, whether you're in uh, you know, Dade County or whether you're in uh, you know, Paloma State, I mean, the reality is that, that a breakup for any child is traumatic. And, and for all of the reasons that it could involve, but but sadly for me, I mean, it was it was something that should have happened uh, sooner. Given uh, my parents were quite abusive with one another, uh, pissed off at life, and likely and often upset with each other. Um, I, I always would hear the sounds of uh, you know screaming, uh, upset, anger, uh, bottles thrown, things broken. It wasn't an environment for any child, for that matter. And often in that state, I would often be removed from it and be put outside, like 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 the empties. Uh, hoping to get picked up in the morning by the delivery man. I mean, so I would be put outside so I wouldn't see it all in its entirety. But in those moments as a five-year-old, you think to yourself, well, gosh, I guess, I guess I'm on my own. Now, I don't know about you, but for anyone today who's raised a child of their own, you, you couldn't even imagine likely right now even putting a five-year-old outside of the safety of your own home whether you're in a, a, a house or whether you're in a mansion. Uh, but in my case, even if you're in an apartment, um, that's just not a safe place to be. So I think for me, the, the thing that I realize, recognize, and likely share in common with you, my friend, is that we really learn from an early age that, you know what, if I'm on my own, it's, 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 I, I will grow. And so we, we, it made us stronger. It didn't make us weaker. It, it made us step forward, not step back. It, it made us stand up, not curl up. And it, and it let us become the men and the leaders we are today. So 
um, that was kind of the beginnings for me. So broken home, inner city kid. Um, and to your latter part of your question, uh, again, Toronto was going through a little bit of an identity crisis. I mean, like anybody else during the 70s and 80s, there was a real influx of immigration. And uh, just by looking at me, no matter how handsome you might find me, uh, I mean, I ain't black and I ain't white. And during that time, uh, this color was confusing. Uh, unlike my Southern friends who, who were, when you're this color, you're, you're considered Mexican or Spanish. Um, back then, man, you, you were either black or you were white. And uh, I wasn't white and I wasn't black. And so it was really hard to find out what I was because I was a mix. And, and although I won't pull the interracial card, my mom is very much browner than I. And my dad was quite white like you. So I would be considered an interracial mix, if it were. And that in itself created a lot of dynamics growing up because I would be made fun of. I'd be called names. Uh, I'd be called uh, horrible names that were, you know, today, if I would even say them, they, they would be considered a racist. So I won't even dare repeat them. But they were degrading. And I think that when children are degraded, they pull back. And what they actually forfeit is belonging. They feel like they don't fit in. They feel like they don't belong. They don't feel like they can actually uh, have lunch with these guys or, or hang out with those fellas. Um, they don't apply themselves fully. They don't actually step forward. They step into the shadows that are cast by, by the bullies and by those who have these prospects and these views. Now, believe me, I'm not crying the blues, but, but as I'm unpacking this with you right now, live and together, uh, Tony, afforded by your podcast and who you are, you, you just get represents of the fact that, gosh, I mean, kids today don't go through that kind of stuff. They're going through a different type of stuff. That's a whole different ball of wax. But for that, I mean, Toronto had its own identity crisis, which I'm glad it's outgrown. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. What what neighborhood uh, or what section of the city were you from? In downtown Toronto. I was downtown. uh I was I was what what would be called um well, I first of all grew up in a place called Thorncliffe Park, which was known as the park, uh neighboring uh, Flemington Park. And if anyone ever Googled it back in those times, I, I mean you're talking about stabbings and shootings, robberies and breaking ins and enters and I mean, I mean, our, 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 our apartment was broken into once. And I remember the burglar came in, stole a bunch of stuff and left. And I was sitting on the couch watching it all as a young, young youngster. I mean, that's, that's just the times we worked in. It's like, Hey, he's like, Hey, um, I mean, I just ate a sandwich while it was happening. And I remember when my father came home and said, what the hell happened to the stereo with all our stuff. And I'm like, um, the guy came in through the door over there, which was a balcony. We we're on the second floor. Someone climbed and took it. And he goes, well, why don't you, why don't you say something? It's like, what was I supposed to say? And I remember my parents fighting about that at the time I was only, you know, a few years old, but I remember that man doing that. So, so yeah, so Thorncliffe Park, um, definitely part of sort of a network of hoods, if it were, um, a beautiful place at the time. I can't, I can't lie. It was, it was beautiful in my eyes, but, um, looking back, I know what, what it's, what it's downside was. Thank you, Rich. All right, Rich. So you already kind of hinted at your, your child. Can you describe like your first 10 years, um, maybe in summary, like what the events were that, uh, how that eventually unfolded where you started to progress to your teenage years where you, you were in Toronto the whole time. Yeah, I was in Toronto the whole time. I mean, a young kid, like most kids that would grow up in and out of a broken home, you know, for those who have somewhat partially cooperative parents um, that may not be able to stand each other, they have, you know, really shared custody. So, I mean, for the first 10 years for me, it was always a real difficult time because uh, there's only one Christmas. There's only one Easter right? There's only one summer, there's only one March break or spring break, and you got to choose who you're going to spend it with. And, and so I always hated those holidays because it always meant that I was going to make someone happy and someone angry. Uh, I always knew that someone's going to be really happy to hear that I'm coming to them and someone's going to be really upset and make me wrong for not choosing them first. And so it was always a difficult time. So for the first 10 years, I think I really just took a lot of real salvation and the opportunity of really finding safety for myself with my friends. I grew up with a handful of friends that uh, were real brothers for me. Their, their home was my, 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 my salvation and uh, their family was my family. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm talking about a guy like Uncle Roy or my cousins, Kieran and Jeff. I mean, we weren't blood related, but we, we by osmosis, we became related because I was there so damn much. I was pretty much like furniture. So I think for kids um, today, I, I really am sad for anybody that's in a tough situation where they can't have a place to go to, a place to escape to especially in this internet connected social media networked world we're in we're always seemingly connected but we don't strive to disconnect to go somewhere else that feels safer that feels more loving that feels more embracing that feels more well more more warm 
right? More warm. And so for me, my first 10 years was, was a lot of that, that my, my, my mother remarried, which was lovely for her and uh, good for me. But um, I still think that in my world growing up, and I think people can relate to this, um, displacement, which is not new for us right now. At the time of this recording, we're looking at what's happening on the other side of the planet, while an entire country of 44 million people get displaced. 10 million are up to now. Yeah. From I mean, Ukraine. Yeah, but but I mean, just literally, like you're talking about a number right as of now that have left the country. We're talking about the rest of the country saying, I, I don't know where I'm going to go. Um, but both numbers are accurate. The reality is this displacement is a real phenomenon of crisis. It's confusing. It's discomforting. You don't know what to call home. You don't know where you're going to sleep tomorrow. And so for me, I know that the first 10 years was that it was it was just trying to reinvent where home was for me. So being shared in a split custody situation was not uh, was not easy, but I also know it also helped contribute to the the person I I would evolve into eventually. Thank you, Rich. So your uh, early teenager years, um, where where were you sharing between your mom and your dad's house, going different, splitting it up, and and how did that eventually uh, work out? Yeah, what's simply interestingly cool is, I mean, my parents were super young when they had me. So uh, unlike, I mean, these days, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, I, I waited till I was, you know, into my 30s than when I started to have kids. Um, some people are waiting longer. We, we were doing it because we want to find ourselves, you know, get our financial footing, have a foundation or just really call it true love. Like, I really want to do it with someone special. So for myself, I mean, gosh, growing up, it was interesting because my mother remarried and, um, and moved north of the city into the suburbs. And we all have suburbs, right? The place that's furthest away from the center of all the action, right? Um, and for my dad, he remained in the city. So what was interesting for me was it was really tough to go into the city because it was the depths of where a lot of different types of action would happen, a whole different dynamic of challenges and, and, and I mean, different types of friends I had. And then of course, where my mother moved was like, I mean, nearly farm country, like most suburbs in any uh, time of the eighties, uh, you couldn't uh, be hard pressed to find a farm not too far from a subdivision because they were still developing lots of raw lands. So that was tough. I mean, you, you'd had to, you had to walk for an hour to get to somewhere cool. Um, so I found a lot of salvation in staying with my grandmother. So my mother's mother, my grandmother, who lived exactly where my parents lived in the exact same building, I stayed there. So I found was I found my, my, my home was really with my grandmother. My mm -hmm. grandmother was the place I stayed. And I got to tell you, brother, um, she was, she was a very poor woman. And um, I slept on a floor because she didn't have an, ex, an extra bed. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't exactly the most comfortable place, but I got to tell you, man, amongst the rats and the mice, along with the cockroaches that came with it, you had to just hurry up and fall asleep. So you didn't hear them in the middle of the night, man, it was home. It, it was the one constant place in my life that I knew I can always count on, regardless of what my mother was up to. And regardless of what my dad was up to, because they both were very, uh, mobile, young, uh, bustling, going after it. But the constant was my grandmother. So my grandmother raised me. She, she was, she was my rock. She was my, my, my corner man. She was the most amazing, most dependable and reliable thing in my life. So um, that's probably why I have a lot of respect for, for grandmothers, women um, who really are the custodians and the matriarchs of much family. So uh, that's, that's, that's where I stayed. That's where I grew up, man. Rich, you really did come through a lot of struggles, man. Like, did you did you wind up getting into involved with gangs and drugs and all that stuff in the inner city? That's usually the path for many people who go from your no, route. No, for sure. And I think that back in that time, you 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 know you you wanted to have some sort of a maybe a title or a sense of belonging. And although there were gangs and there were cliques, and yes, there were there were fights. Lucky for me, my dad was what we called a real man's man. That, that was his self-declaration, a real man's man. So, so he would always start a, a sentence by saying, real men do this and, and real men do that. And if I didn't like something, he goes, well, if you want to be a real man, you'll do this. <laughs> and so, of course, guess what that childhood looked like, right? So I was doing things that children probably shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> and I was getting myself into things that only men really were reserved for. But, but nevertheless, that really grew me up in a hurry. So... So I, I learned how to fight very young. Um, I took up a lot of different martial arts and boxing for a very, very long time as a thing to do. And it somewhat kept me out of trouble. But, but luckily, you know what? I was, um, you know, I was, I was never in jail. I, I never got a record. Um, I never did something that really got me into serious trouble, but I definitely did trouble. Like, I mean, 
we, we, we stole shit and we, 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 we fenced things and, you know, we, we jumped fences and we snuck into places that you should have paid and we boarded buses without paying the fares. And we did all the things that you needed to do to just get from point A to point B, but, but nothing that really altered the trajectory of my life because of that one event or that one incident. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, absolutely. Came, came close. Yeah. Came close, you know, st stole my uncle's car um, at a very young age and, you know, crashed into something and figured out, okay, well, let me just park it. And maybe no one will notice that wasn't good. Um, you know, so things like that has happened, but, but for me, you know, you're right. It was, it was, um, I have to say, and here's a second word I'd offer your listeners and, and that definitely those who want to turn this into an opportunity. I, I was really blessed to not just have a lot of family that cared about me, surprisingly, like uncles that came in and gave me the, the pep talk. Like, Rich, listen, if you keep going at this rate, man, you're going to either wind up dead or in jail. Or if you keep fighting like this, you're not going to be welcomed in any school. Or if you keep getting like this or you keep. So I had I, I did have some family uncles in particular that were really strong and well versed to just kind of keep me aware of what I was doing wrong. If I listened, I don't know. I don't think I would have or else I, I have to wonder why they visited me so much. And it's like because I was probably not listening. But, but the word is and the word is and here it comes. Is, is mentors. I really recognize now looking back, having conversations like these, which are, by the way, very rare. This conversation is a real delight for me to have, by the way. So thank you so much, Tony, and, and to the listeners, um, giving me the space to do this. Uh, it's not every day I get to talk about this, these kind of memories. So it's um, definitely a challenge to, to, to reach back there into the memory vaults and pull it out. But I had mentors, people who said, you know, kid, you got something. You, you know what? I see something special in you. You, you know what, kid, you remind me of me. Or, or hey, uh, Rich, you know, why don't you come on over here? And why don't you help me out with that? So I had a number of those during that time. So during my teen years, I had people that really kind of championed me, you know, brought me under their wing, um, kind of gave me a kick in the ass or a smack in the head. Uh, right at the right times and not because they were related, but because they they cared. And um, you, you can't you cannot diminish the value of people um, looking out for you and not recognize that that's mentorship in action. Right. That's mentorship in action. They didn't get paid to be my coach. They didn't get paid to train me or show me the way they didn't get paid to babysit or keep me out of trouble. They looked out for you. And, and, and some of those are friends and some of those are neighbors and some of those are the big brothers or the big sisters of your friends that you're growing up with and causing shit with. And uh, for all of those, I'm grateful for. So um, thank God for mentors. Thank God for mentors. Yeah, that, that's incredible, Rich. And yeah, I mean, walking the edge is, uh, is a very dangerous line. So sometimes, and I have a very similar story to you. I mean, I, I've walked the, the edge. I mean, sometimes I wonder what, why I even live past 18, let alone my best friend killed himself at 18. And, and, you know, he was my cousin. A lot of my, I was one of the only, one of the few people in my family that actually had the, the fa mother father relationship, even though they were tough parents. Um, at least I had parents and a lot of my close cousins and, you know, family and friends, they didn't. And uh, my cousin that killed himself, you know, was, he had the same situation as you. There's so many more examples that I can give you of people just like yourself that, stop short because of those reasons and you kept going. So, I mean, that's, that's very impressive. And the fact that you didn't get in trouble or any of that stuff. I mean, if you look at back on your life in a rear view mirror, uh, it, it, it becomes like, almost like it's not a coincidence anymore. There's something else. <laughs> There's something yeah. else why you keep going. There's some higher force that's pushing the both of us. And, 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 and despite as many obstacles we have and, and C rock has a, a more similar story to you than, than me in that regard um, because he had the same situation with a conflict with parents and, and the fact that he's here now he's doing business with Grant Cardone. It's, you know, would you say it's, it's fate or I don't really want to get too much into that conversation. I know, but, but that's a fair saying? question though, Tony. I mean, like, you know, when you look at yourself and, and by the way, can, you know, first of all, my condolences on, on what happened to you at such a young age. I mean, we never stop celebrating and remembering and honoring the people that we've lost. Right. Um, so that, that, that strikes a chord for me. So my, my heart's out to you, man. But, um, you know, for a lot of people, we don't realize that a big part of, of what we've become is actually caused and created. That's the third most important thing I'll say today. And what I mean by that is there's been a lot of talk. I mean, you know, when I grew up and I started realizing I needed to read smart books and I don't know where that inspiration came from. I don't know if I looked up the people that said, read this, or I don't, I don't remember if there was a moment really there's, there's probably specks of moments where I got a little bit of a, hmm, maybe I should check that out. 
uh, whether it was discovering Tony Robbins for the first time or, or reading Think and Grow Rich for the first time or really getting into the self-help stuff when my friends were, you know, you know, jacking cars and, and, and I mean, <laughs> and hanging out with chicks um, and no offense to either of them. I mean, those are both great activities. But at that age, I just felt like I needed to do something because I really just felt compelled for it. But 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 what I'm saying is that as I've hung out in the self-help human betterment industry for now three decades, I've written 14 titles in the subject matter. I've worked with all the most iconic greats in the world, including Grant and Tony and Bob Proctor and, and T. Harv Eker. And I mean, the folks from The Secret, I mean, the list goes on. I'm blessed to have worked with all the powerhouses, the icons, the thought leaders in that space. I, I've come to realize of, of many things, purpose isn't something we're born with. And it's not something you find. It is absolutely something you create. And, and purpose really is your future. So when someone says, I'm really looking for my purpose, I'm really looking for the thing I meant to do. It's, it's like, it's something that's compelling me to do it. Well, well, think about it. You're not, you're not, you're not born with that. You're not born with the job description. You weren't born with the rules and responsibilities. You don't have, you didn't come out the shoot with this, with this assignment tacked on your tacked on your ass that says, this is what Tony's got to do by the time he dies, right? Yeah. It's not like that. What it's like is you're born with innate gifts. You're born with this innate talent. There's some things that Tony can do that I can't do. There's some things that I can do that Tony can't do. There's some things that C-Rock can do that we can't do. And the list goes on. All of you listening, you all have gifts. So your job in life is to find out what those gifts can really do for yourself and for others. And that's the purpose of the exercise. Find out how you can apply it so that your future, that, that is wishing to emerge, and all of us have one, a tomorrow shall come, whether you're alive or, or dead, to see it is another question. And, that, and that's a different conversation. But it's out there. And if you don't like what's coming, then you've got to alter direction. You've got to alter course. You've got to alter relationships, conversations, discussions, connectivity. You've got to quit that job, give up that relationship, quit doing that stupid shit you keep doing that keeps repeating the same thing. Because here comes the fourth most important thing. Much of what comes next is a template from what's already been. You see, that's the big part that you've got, Tony, that I've got, that C-Rock's got, even Grant's got that. Is, is that one point in our lives we realize I cannot for another minute live this way anymore. Feel this way, be this way, be seen this way, or just live this way. Like there's something that happens when you go enough and you snap. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, something happens and the trajectory of your life alters, even if by a little bit. It, mm -hmm. it, it alters enough that you did something different, but you stuck with it so long the path you now went on was really different than if you had stayed on the other course. If you did nothing, where you would have been is very different from where you now are. Mm. And so for, for, for all of us, I think that's the aha moment where there, you just had to have said enough and you follow that. Where was your moment at that you said enough's enough? I mean, again, it, it, I think it's a succession of things. As we've been talking about where you just said, well, wow, it's amazing that you didn't get into big trouble. Of course I got into big trouble. I've been, I've been suspended. I've been expelled. I mean, I've gotten into horrible fights where I mainly won and once in a while lost. You know, and, and, and I think what ends up happening is that there's two types of events that we characterize that have us really confront powerfully um, our, our sense of self. We, we can now as adults call that an existential aha moment where it's like, like, who the hell am I? But back then as a kid, as a punk or getting into trouble or dealing with pain and anxiety, upset and anger, I mean, it's just like a, like a, like a, man, what am I really doing here? And so for, for me, one of the two types is it can either really, really sadden you. So death, divorce, despair, divide, right? Those things that are like, hey, uh, sorrow becomes you, uh, upset, anguish, mourning. But the other is something can really activate you, anger you, like really infuriate you. So those are the two types that I've, I've witnessed. And then I'm not suggesting that I'm an expert in the space. I'm just a constant observer and student of this thing called life. <laughs> and I document it all along the way. So I suspect that those two types so you've had your type, I've had my type. And depending on the type that you've had, it creates, here it comes, a, 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 hold on, clear, 
like a charge that mm. sets you off this way or that, right? It, it's kind of like Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, a dear friend of mine, he's my client. I've worked with him for now nearly 12 years. Wow. And if you look at his life story, one of the things that you'll really find that truly drove him, when I, when I, when I test my theory right now, the sad or something that really angered you, is sadness really was a thing he battled. And, it's, and it happened with a bully who took a pigeon out of his hand in Brooklyn and snapped the neck of that pigeon right in front of Tyson and threw it to his feet. Whoa. Tyson was devastated in that moment. This is, a, this is a, what we call a crucible moment, a life-altering moment where in that moment, he says, I will never let anybody ever treat me or anything I love like that again. And then something happened in him. He beat the shit out of that book. <laughs> and so what drove Tyson at that time, and uh -huh. self-admittingly, and coupled with my observation and all the conversations we've spent together over the years, is, is he was sad. And so when people look at that fighter, what, what catalyzed that fury as in, in, during his greatest years was he was just sad and he wouldn't let anybody bully him or anything he loved ever again. That's where the fury came. Now, now you activate someone like, now let's fast forward, you look at someone like Michael Jordan, considered one of uh, another great goat, another dear friend, who is the former uh, Chicago Bulls player. Some people would argue, no, that's actually a Wizards player, um, but he was both. But there's a guy who was known to be great, but got cut from the varsity team, a very well-known fact now circulating in many genres of, of, of self-help leadership books. But when he got cut and he saw his name get cut, he was so infuriated, self-admitted, so infuriated that he trained all summer that year because he was going to come back better than ever. And by the way, the story tells itself. Of course he did. And he, wanted to, he, he had a real big, oh, yeah? You want to cut me? Oh, yeah? <laughs> and so he came back. And when you think about the kind of life he then led, think, think about it. Everybody, just think about it. That guy was angry for a long time. And so as a result of him being activated, that crucible moment was angry. So Tyson was the greatest boxer of all time, let's just say, for argument's sake. And he was powered by a very different crucible event, a sad one. Jordan was catalyzed by a crucible event, but an angering one. Both greats, both polar opposites, but on the same plane of suffering. So the question becomes, you want to ask yourself as you review and reflect, is what kind of suffering have we gone through? What crucible moment did you have that really shaped the trajectory of the life you've got? Mm. That is an excellent point, Rich. By the way, um, Mike Tyson, I've always wanted to meet him. He's, he was, he's a legend. I, I, I actually have a martial arts background uh, living in Philly. I don't think we really had a choice but to grow up learning how to fight. Um, you know, we, so Mike Tyson, I asked to keep his picture uh, on my, um, my wall in, in my deepest times. And I, I looked at him and I said, all right, this is this guy. He, he figured his way out. I'm going to figure my way out. So so I, hearing that story, it's it's uh, it's hard, it's heartwarming, and uh, <laughs> and I definitely definitely relate that. I think I think that's uh, incredible that you, you're you're connected with him on that level. So hats off to you there. Thanks, man. We'll 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 have we'll have fun with him soon. Maybe maybe my declaration is you and I when we'll go offline. We'll talk about how we can do something together where I can involve him because I do events with him on a regular basis. Uh, so you get to meet your uh, childhood hero. I get to see my friend, and we get to do something really cool for a lot of people. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And we could probably, if we brought them on clubhouse, wow. It would just completely <laughs> set the stage up. They had, um, uh, what was, what was his name? Gary V on the other day. Someone was asking me, uh, I think it was Ivan Meiser. He's head of BNI. He's a friend of mine. And, um, he was asking me like two weeks ago, is clubhouse still big? I'm like, it depends on who you bring in. And then two days later, Gary V shows up and there's 20,000 people in the room. So there you go. It, it depends on who's, who comes in the room. And uh, Mike Tyson was on Fox News. I was watching him last week. I watch all news channels. I don't watch too much of it. But I just happened to have the business channel just to catch the markets. And he's selling his ear bites now. I think his uh, Evander Holyfield ear bites. So I thought that was pretty funny. I brought that up to Jeff Hoffman, who, who has a relationship with Evander Holyfield, the way you probably do with Mike Tyson uh, last, last week on the clubhouse. And he said, yeah, there's, they're both friends now. They squashed their, their argument and stuff. So.
Some, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that ever will be. If you're missing a part of your ear, every day you look in the mirror, you say, uh, Look, man, these these guys are warriors. You bite me and take an ear off, man. I don't know if I'll ever forgive you. But, but for the cameras and for the public's profile and sense of sanity, yeah, uh, we, we we hang out. <laughs> I love it. All right, great. Well, well thank you. Uh, thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. So I have a lot of questions for you. We've got about a minute, two minutes each, but I want to get the rest of your story. So can you maybe just tell us the rest of how you – now let's do the metamorphosis part where you transvis. We, we heard your struggles. Um, how did you metamorphose into that? And uh, how did you eventually get your, your first breaks and stuff? And, and just as a preface, we're going to be going over a lot of the major things in some of the questions. So we'll, we'll probably catch it there too. Yeah. Well, look, man, I mean, for, for me, uh, there, there came a point where I had a bit of a lucky break. Um, I was at home one day. I was about 16 years of age and I watched a, a movie called Wall Street. And Wall Street starred Michael Douglas, Charlie Sheen. It was uh, about the infamous uh, Gordon Gecko, his famous speech of uh, greed is good. And uh, man, I watched the movie. And aside from all the parts that went bad, uh, I was really inspired by the idea. Like, man, I, I would love to be dressed up like that, wear a tie like that, talk like that, be there like that, do that. And so I, um, I, I, I jumped, uh, jumped off the couch into some clothes, jumped on a bus, went to the store and bought a book on how to buy stocks. I immediately bought a book on how to buy stocks. And uh, what was neat was shortly thereafter, I applied for a cold call job, which is which we call a telemarketer today for a stockbroker. So it just, so I old? would have been 16. I would have been 16 at the time, 16, 17 at that time now. Uh, so I applied and uh, the guy goes, look, kid, you, you realize this doesn't pay much. I'm like, yeah, I got it. He goes, and, and you realize that it's like just it's a whole day of like cold calling. I'm like, yep, I got it. He goes, and you realize that, I mean, it's just going to be a really shitty job, right? I'm like, yep, I got it. <laughs> and I don't know if I really realized that I just was really, really lit up by being in this place. I mean, at that time, a stock brokerage firm was where the buzz was at. This is before, you know, trading online and putting your orders in digitally. I mean, you had to run tickets up and down a hallway. You, you need, you even saw people walking in with cash and opening up accounts. Like it was, it was like the old days. So um, I, I got trained to do 300 cold calls a day, every day. That was my job. I had one tie that I left knotted because I know how to tie a tie uh, and a shirt. Uh, that's all I had was one shirt and I would wash it every night uh, with, with, with soap and water. And then I had a can of starch and I would, I would iron that shirt. I ironed that shirt so much that it, I burnt through it at some point and had to buy a new one. But that's where I started, man. I started off as a cold call cowboy in the financial services business. And, um, and that was where I cut my teeth. Two years of doing that full time, helping stockbrokers build their book of business. And, and, I, and I earned a reputation of being um, ferociously consistent, uh, incredibly hungry. But the truth was something happened simultaneously. You see, this was the big crucible event. I think if there was one that was really big and that would dwarf my parents divorcing, it was this one was that my stepfather and I had a, a real, real, a real tough time with each other. And uh, he called me out and he says, listen, if you can't live to the rules of this house, then you can leave. And I said, you know what, I'm out. And uh, I packed my things, threw it all in a garbage bag and then never went back. So I left the house at that time. And so I, I moved in with a friend and um, I mean, I had to survive. I had to pay my share of a rent. I, I thought cable was free. I thought it just came out of the wall. That's not true. Uh, I had to pay for that. I had to pay for everything. And um, so at that time, I, I dropped out of school wow. and took the summer job I had cold calling and turned it into my full time occupation, A, because I loved it, but B, because I couldn't afford to go to school. I, I didn't have any part time work at night that would pay for the bills I had. And, and that's what I did for a couple of years. So, I mean, as a high school dropout in what I would describe was the lucky sperm club um, inner circle, it wasn't the right mix. I mean, oh, by the way. Again, I'm not black and I'm not white. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not calling uh, Toronto at the time racist. Uh, the firm I worked with then became Merrill Lynch and I'm not calling them either racist. That's not what I'm saying. At the time in, in society, in the early 90s, I was an unusual character to be in that inner circle. Does that track? So for Chris, me- can I, can I pause here for a second? Yeah. Um, do you have a, a little Italy in Toronto? We do have a little Italy in Toronto. You, you, did you feel like maybe you would have compelled to, to be in that community? Because, I mean, you do look a little bit of Italian. I'm a light-skinned Italian, but I got hey. parents that, that look very dark. <laughs> so I came out of that. Listen, 
I mean, it's funny you should bring that up because you're kind of jumping the queue here, but I'll, I'll, I'll trend with you. Um, that's why I married likely an Italian. That's likely why I actually, in fact, um, you know, have a son who's half Italian. And, and funnily enough, I did a 23 and me and found out that I was actually 10% Italian. And, and what's amazing about that 10% is I think it was by osmosis. I ate so much pasta, pasta fagioli, uh, cannolis, and all the rest of the wonderful cuisine that comes with the Italian culture that I probably by osmosis became part Italian. But truth be told, I am. I did find out there's DNA traces that I have partly Italian. But my point, though, is that growing up, I didn't really have Italian friends. Remember, folks, we are a byproduct of our proximity mm. to people and experiences. So if you never, in fact, found yourself in a clique, in a mm. community, or among people that were Italian, guess what? You never really truly discover what Italian even means. Mm -hmm. So being born in a world where there wasn't an Italian for miles, wow. that was difficult for me to see that. So it wasn't until I actually got this job and started working in the brokerage business and became a, a very respectable marketing assistant to guys who were really serious about gathering assets um, that I actually expanded my horizon and I started finding myself in different circles. That's how I found myself on a plane one day and heading on a trip somewhere, first time ever, and, and met a woman who later would become my wife, who just so happens to be Italian. And, and that's a whole different trajectory for me because if it wasn't for her and her family in the Italian way and culture, gosh, I don't know Tony where I'd be. Mm. Um, I mean, I really have a lot to say about the Italian people. And I'm not saying that they're better than Greeks or better than Portuguese or better. They're not saying they're better, um, but they're a standard one and by themselves. They, they, they have strong values that worked for me. They have a strong kinship to um, uh, values and reasons to celebrate and, and, and certain moral compass that I really appreciated and quickly adopted. So um, I, I owe a lot in my life to my wife and I owe a lot of who I've become to the Italian folk. Sorry to digress there. I just, I thought that was a very important point because when you said this earlier, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to, to feel odd and we have such a weird culture and this is my view and i don't want to get too much on it but we got eight billion colors in this world well, everybody tries to put people in black and white boxes but when you grow up in a, in a community where you have even in your own family i got i grew up i had blonde hair blue eyes my parents looked nothing like me and i walked down the street they always thought i was the mailman's kid when you grow up in a community that that people have all different variations of looks that just proves right there we're, we're all different so, and, and to, to say everybody's black and white, you know, and it makes those people in the middle always feel uncomfortable. You know, it's like, well, that's not true. <laughs> well, what are, what are we being labeled for? So I, I know what you, you went through. That's why I asked you that because, it, you know, that probably would have at least temporarily solved some of the issues that you were growing up with. If you, fe if you, if a person like you were in that kind of community, you would never felt like that because we're, we're in the middle, people are used to variations a lot more than the extremes. No, you're right. And I think for me, um, you know, I wish I wish I met them sooner. Um, I mean, you know, again, digression aside, when I was with my father on weekends, he lived in Little Italy. So, so, um, and there's a little place called Little Portugal. Actually, I grew up thinking I was Portuguese. For the longest time, I would tell people I was, I was half Portuguese because I was in Little Portugal. So Little Portugal, for those who know Toronto, is just south of Little Italy. So we never really went into Little Italy, but we neighbored Little Italy. So there was this like proverbial border and you rarely cross it because it felt like a different world. So did I cross it once in a while? You bet. But we never really hung out in there. So it's amazing that as close as I was to the world of it, Italians, I wasn't really in the world of Italians. And so but being in the world of Portuguese, I, I, I grew up thinking I was a Portuguese. I really did. It's like a little bit of like uh, the jungle book, you know, kid grows up amongst the, the wilderness and he thinks he's, you know, he's the wilderness. So we are a byproduct of the conversations, the people, the things we learn and the people we surround ourselves with by osmosis, mm. we, come, we become the average of them all. So, so luckily for me, yeah, I, um, I'm grateful for, for, for the trajectory of uh, to, to, to marriage and, and into an Italian family. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate you. Uh, awesome, awesome response. So I think, so you, do you want to talk about how you eventually got into maybe sum it up in a minute, like how you eventually got into um, meeting all these crazy people and being big speakers just if, just for a minute, because I'm going to definitely got questions that will be tailored to all your major events. And, and just well, 
Yeah, I think I think this is a great segue into like, you know, how do we get to this conversation called how Richard's a money mentor and a financial coach in yeah. the world mm-hmm. and in such a profound way. So, I mean, being in the financial services business, one of my greatest roles in that space was attracting assets, was was raising capital, was finding clients, getting investors. So regardless of the institution or company that I was working with, that was my job. My job was to be able to open up doors and do just that. And so as a result of doing that, what I found myself in was a position of being able to attract people to what we were up to. What I recognized, though, was I wanted to go where a lot of eyeballs were on. We didn't have social media back then. We didn't have you know, Clubhouse. We didn't have IG, Instagram, social media, for that matter, let alone the internet. Uh, maybe we had some internet, but we didn't have a way to come together in a way that made sense. So I would sponsor events that very, very large celebrities were going to be attending and was able to, in fact, be also a part of the speaking roster. And uh, I mean, this is a practice we see today now at, at, at great lengths. Lots of people are what we call brand blending, right? Hire three great celebrities and put yourself in the lineup and all of a sudden you're one too. So I did this back in the early 2000s, and the very first person I did it with, which probably put me on the map super fast, was a a now retired former president named uh, William Jefferson Clinton. And, uh, you know, the 42nd president of the United States of America, here I was just about to start touring with him right out the gate. So it's kind of like, you know, wanting to star in a play and, and wanting to do something in the community, maybe at the church or, or maybe wanting to get one day, my ambitions would be on off Broadway. I went straight to Broadway and, um, and, and I, and then I didn't, and I didn't fail to deliver. And that's what started it. What started it was I was of great service to him. I was, I, I got bit by the bug of loving doing what I did from a stage and doing it with a great celebrity and icon like that. Um, and then just being able to say, Hey, if I can ever be of service to you again, Mr. President, let me know. And uh, I got to stand aside alongside him for, for 17 more shows over the past few years. But of course, when you profile that, then other people who've got that kind of profile say, well, let's get that guy, uh, uh, Richard Dolan, right? Let's get that guy. He, he's not Italian, but he looks it. Let's get that guy. The guy was good. He did good by Mr. You know, President Clinton. And so I would do that with the next celebrity and the next celebrity. So I began to build this really great momentum of always being of service to very heavyweight, iconic brands. Um, so that's that's kind of how it started. That's and the key I, moment. It was the it was the uh, Bill Clinton story. For sure, for wow. sure, I, absolutely. Um, I even I even here's what's even better. I even have on video, which is a which is a miracle that that actually captures the moment that when I finished introducing him, he goes on stage, and then he thanks me. And I had admitted to him about an hour earlier that I'm super nervous to do. <laughs> but he says to everybody that I'm nervous. He actually told everyone that I told him. That. And uh, if you ever watch the video, and I can cue it up for you one day, but I mean, it was just really amazing that he says, hey, you know, I, I no, didn't do a great job. I should actually be introducing him. It should be the other way around. I'm like, oh, dude, what a, what a classy move. So I fell in love with him and, and, and he with me. And it's been a real pleasure to do a lot of business and a lot of work with him. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, and I, I'm not a political person. I don't pick sides, but I, I got his, I, I, it's part of, Bill Clinton's actually part of my story too. I was an intern at the White House. Um, I went to school in GW. And so I, I worked in the travel office for him. And uh, it was the year after the Monica Lewinsky thing. So <laughs> it was kind of a, it was a rough uh, water cooler conversation every day you know in there but it was um he, it's he's cool an man incredible speaker though what an, he's oh. just one of the top speakers ever he, he really is that that man is uh, one of the most powerfully present people i've ever met ever watched and i got to see him in um you know on a stage and backstage and i've seen him with people and one-on-one I've, I've had so much time with him that i've just observed him and um but it's a talent i feel i know we're digressing again but it's a talent that i feel that uh, that all us presidents share in common or at least the ones i've been able to be in the witness of so i've been in the witness of and have worked alongside of the likes of uh, president clinton um you know george w bush uh george bush uh also obama president obama and uh then donald trump and and i have to say that all but one 
all but one, and you can probably guess who it is. Probably no, again, not picking sides. I'm Canadian, but we're entertained by your politics. All but all but one. We're entertained by our politics. <laughs> but 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 man, Tony, all but one was always profoundly engaged with the person they're speaking with. Only one didn't seem very interested and couldn't wait for the conversation to be over. And um, which is a shame, but I mean, that's what I noticed. I had, a, I had said to myself, man, that's, that's a presidential quality where they can speak to you. And I'm sure you witnessed this too, when you were in his company or around him, that, that whoever he was speaking with, that was the only person that mattered. In fact, underscoring this, uh, his former secretary of state, um, Albright just passed, God bless her. Yeah. I heard and, I, and, and I just watched and I just watched uh, a beautiful homage that was paid to her on television. And they showed a clip where she was being sworn in as Secretary of State and, and off to her immediate left was President Clinton over, over overseeing this this particular exercise, this moment of being sworn in as, as the Secretary of State. And I watched him and he never, ever, ever his eyes were locked on her. His entire being was locked on her in that moment. And there's nothing else around him that mattered as much as her in that moment. And that, that just underscores a presidential quality where mm. they're just incredibly profoundly present to people. Mm. Yeah, that, I, that's a great point, Richard. Uh, Madeline Albright, um, she, she actually did the, the graduation ceremonial speech because <laughs> GW, we were, we were like four blocks from the White House. So we always had... So she did my graduation ceremonial speech, and uh, and it wouldn't. It's such a shame to hear her that she passed today. So that's yeah. was it yesterday or it was just last night, I think. It was it was yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. it was yesterday. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rich. All right, Rich. So I, I want to get into the, the questions here, learn more about you. We got a lot of questions. Figure about a minute, two minutes each tops, and we'll make some good timing. I want to talk about your books. So you got you got a lot of uh, books that you've been published in. You want to give it a quick snapshot of that and highlight any ones that you. You want to talk about? Yeah, I think I think for anybody that's entering into the space that wants to be a speaker or a trainer or a coach or a mentor, I mean, one of the most basic things that we always were taught to do was to write a book. You know, you write a book and it's kind of like your your stand, it's your stake in the ground, so to speak. You write this book and you own that topic. But but really, when you think about it, books don't really make a difference. When you really think about it, and 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 books alone and by themselves don't make a difference. You you you've got to be a real champion for your stuff. You've got to get evangelistical about what you write. You've got to get out there and make sure people are applying what it is that you think and you've said and you've published works. So, um, but nevertheless, I, I wrote and authored and published fourteen titles um, across subjects like leadership, uh, subjects like um, you know performance psychology, uh, topics like and mostly around money. So in the domain of money, wealth, and worth, that's where I've really hung out. I, I, I studied um, quite extensively and were mentored by great leaders in the space of uh, behavioral finance, happiness economics, uh, investor resilience, um, positive psychology. Th those areas I really studied hard in to really understand human beings' relationship to more. And, and that's where the majority of my work is. So those published goods have become program learning. Um, you know, I became a visiting professor at Schulich School of Business, the Executive Development Division, uh, where I taught the uh, Certified Wealth Management course in Marketing and Selling Wealth Management Services, and um, and yeah, I mean, it, I mean that that business school is one of the top five in the world. And so for for me, anything that I've written, all the IP I've gathered, really goes into what I call program learning. So I rather teach it, I rather lead it, I rather put it into programs, workshops, or online learning than just simply say, hey, here's a book read it, I hope you apply it. I'm not in for that. So I've stopped publishing books now for, for probably maybe six years, seven years since the last book I wrote, uh, which was called Performance, um, which was on actually sports psychology. So uh, that was the last book I would say I wrote. How, how come you haven't published any in six years? Well, because I've been busy teaching the stuff I wrote in the previous working titles. So that, that's likely why. I mean, that's again, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it, what, what's amazing here, I'm going to come off camera for a second. I'll grab yeah. something, but what's sure. amazing as I reach for it is um, like that was the book right there. So when you look at performance, which is me being able to decode human excellence through sports psychology, I got my dear friend Mike Tyson to write the foreword and my oh, other wow. dear friend, um, my <laughs> other dear incredible. friend, Juwan, Juwan Howard, um, who wow. led me to my first championship ring from the Miami Heat. He wrote the afterword. So 
Oh, I am really... buying that book after this episode. I am buying oh, dude, it. Dude, there's one in the mail coming right to you, brother, because I got you. We're going to be. No, no, so I, I got to support you, man. I got to support oh. you. <laughs> you can support me by having me here more often. That's the way we support, okay. we support each other. Um, but yeah, so that book right there is, is going to be uh, curriculumized now, and it's going to be taught to a lot of my students in Rich U. So it's, it's, it's all that I learned in the world of sports psychology, uh, working with you know the likes of uh, and observing quite closely Tiger Woods, uh, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Tom Brady, uh, Tyson, of course, Juwan, of course, LeBron James, of course. Um, so it, it's, it was a great way for me to just capture the years I spent uh, on a little bit of a, a sidebar working with um, professional athletes. Um, so at most of your books, were they, uh, co-authored or do you, do you have any books, do you have any books that you're purely an author of, or is it? Yeah, my, 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 my it's funny. My very first book was co-authored, um, by one of my first earliest mentors. So I'm the co-author of that book called the invincible investor. Okay. The invincible investor was, I was a co-author. So it was, um, led authored by my, my, my chief. Um, and one of my first and most admired uh, mentors, Dr. Paul Stoltz. But then the second, this book here I just showed you, um, I, I, I co-authored with Dr. David Todd. So uh, those are the only two titles that I'm actually featured as a co-author in. All the other books that I've got in my life and in my world are all truly led, authored by myself. Wow. That is awesome. That is yeah. incredible. That's yeah, true. Um, how, how did you get like my, the question is coming out to me now, like, how did you go from getting, uh, becoming the speaker for, uh, Bill Clinton and, and doing that, that whole connection thing? How did you eventually get people like Mike Tyson? I mean, that's a big jump. I know it was incredible when you, when you pulled off, but to get into that league, um, it's, it's a, it was a complete diversion. You're going from a major president to, to sports players. I and mean, that's, but, but remember, man, I mean, I, I, at the time was, again, I was in the money business. I was raising money for things. I wanted to raise more money for my international real estate development deals. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book called The Life Rich Real Estate Book, an investment philosophy based on the phenomenon of people's pursuit of place with purpose. And if you can tell right there, the chairman of Sotheby's, yeah. chairman of Sotheby's wrote the foreword. That was an awesome book. And then I started selling U.S. real estate. So I wrote the guidebook on how to, in fact, buy U.S. real estate. Very super cool. You want to know who wrote the foreword? Let's take a look. In this book, do you know who writes the foreword? U.S. Ambassador Frederick Bush. Wow. Amazing, right? So, so these became marketing pieces for me. But back to your question, then here's what happens. As President Clinton's touring, another big celebrity was added to the roster. My hero, the man I learned much from, Tony Robbins. So as I enter the stage now with Tony Robbins, he's like, hey, Dolan, say I. I'm like, I. He goes, now, look, man, you got to stop with these real estate books and raising money. You got to write a book that really moves people. So I wrote another book. And this is what started. I wrote this book called Make Your Move. So this book called Make Your Move, which really was actually a, a, a homage to Tony when he actually makes a move. It's his power move before he leads programs. This book was now the platform I was speaking on. So what began to happen was I moved away from, from all these other books where I'm writing these books and I have, it, it's all about a hidden agenda. It's all about raising money. It's all about just talking dough to now talking about something a bit broader so that it allows me to really be a speaker, a motivator, someone who can really be looked up to and admired. And then we'll talk about money later. So that's what happened. And, um, and as a result of doing great jobs and, and performing in the way I did, I guess that they, they kept inviting me back. You know, that's, that's what people forget is that you just can't pay your way. At some point you've got to play and you've got to perform. Mm. That's brilliant, yeah. brilliant story. I, I didn't know that. And I was, I was thinking you were going to say with the Tony Robbins thing, guess who did the forward for this book? Did Tony have any part in that one? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Tony, Tony actually, in fact, was a, a real proponent. I mean, he's endorsed me. He's given me great accolades. I've got um, endorsements from him. They, they, you know, they appear on a lot of my sizzle reels. I mean, that's, that's all cool. But, but the reality is that I, and this is the real, just darn honest truth. I didn't want to ride anyone else's coattails. I, I didn't want to be someone else's guy. And I, and I know that I know we're playing a game right now in the world yeah. of social media and stuff where by osmosis and through brand blending, um, we, 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 we're, we, we're becoming optically someone 
that yeah. we truthfully just really aren't. And when that celebrity leaves or that gravitas departs or when the illusion is over, you're still standing. Remember, wherever you go, there you are. So I really wanted to like, just really truly stand on my two feet. And I got to tell you, that was tough because I probably could have played this game a lot better and a lot differently and leveraged the crap out of the associations I have with a lot of these people earlier on. Yeah. But I just didn't feel like I either deserved it or I didn't feel like it would honor that relationship. And likely, Tony, to be really just straight, I didn't want to lose the relationships. Because if in those days, if you stepped out of line and used an endorsement or used the picture in a way that you're not supposed to, you'd get called out on it. Wow. Today, I mean, I see people... I mean, photoshopping pictures of themselves into pictures with celebrities they're not with and putting themselves in videos on shows that never appeared. I mean, it's just it's just kind of like the distruth of the the, the way the media right now is working for us, the social media that is. Mm. So I think for, for me, I'm just I'm just really happy that I've now grown up and into my own resume. And, and that's why I'm getting into the best part of my work now. Yeah, you got your own personal brand going on and and. And Richard, you, your story is so incredible. You can be on your own. You can do your own thing. You can be another, <clears throat> excuse me, Tony Robbins or whatever, your own version of it. Not Tony Robbins, but you're you. And on that level, you know, the level he's at, but you. And you you're, you got all the background. Um, Jeff Hoffman said, we, had, we actually designed the Clubhouse stage uh, last Friday based on one of the points he made in the podcast interview two weeks ago. Um, was that does money follow attention? That's what that's what Grant Cardone's line is. And I asked him that question. And he had a great line. Money follows excellence. And he had to think about this question because he didn't quite get it. But on the stage last Friday, he came with an even sharper answer. He goes, the tension will come after you got excellence, right? Because like you can go take a picture, a video of something goofy and put it on YouTube and get go viral. But you could be a nobody and, and you, you have no substance to base it on. So after you make, maybe you'll make some money on it. But after the, 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 the smoke clears, you're, you're still not excellent and you're not going anywhere with that. Right. But the excellent people, the people who do something, whatever it is, great, the attention eventually follows. And in your case, you have an excellent background. So, you know, you're, I was looking at your social media platform. It's not that crazy, but you got an excellent background. You could start boosting it up now right so I'm you know, what's, it, what's your it, thoughts on that well dude you're 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 intuitively correct and uh you're quite attuned because my whole team around me is, is saying the same thing i mean look for, for anyone that's listening to this i mean a lot of us likely share a number of things in common right we, we we love being a part of great conversations that's what we count on you tony to do so that's fantastic you know we're in the right place and again if i haven't said it enough man i'm so grateful to have this conversation it's been the so same such thing. a delight to be in such an authentic place to converse with someone. So thank you. Um, I mean, number two is, is, is we all want more. I mean, I've traditionally said to people that we want more, uh, uh, more money, more omnipresence, more results, or, or more entrepreneurial excellence. Usually one of those four things, usually love, relationship, spiritual soundness, health, all, all of course, the obvious firsts. But, but for me, I really do believe that the time has now come where, where, and here comes a real big, the fifth big point I'll make today is until you become a living demonstration, until you are a living, breathing example of the work you profess and wish to sell to people, you should you don't deserve to sell it. And, and I find that when you tell the truth on the self-help human betterment industry, that's a little bit of the challenge that we've had in this multi-billion dollar realm is that people are selling stuff that they don't even use. They're, they're, they're preaching and teaching you things that they haven't even applied. People are really not walking the walk. They're just talking talk. And in a world where we're really hyper-connected and we can find anything out about one another, it's really easy to find out if you truly are living in alignment and agreement to the stuff you preach and teach. That's why people love Gary Vaynerchuk, as you cited him earlier on, because the guy, what you see is what you get. Who he is on camera is who he is off camera at any time of the day with his dad, with his family, with whomever. So for me, you're right. You're, you're spot on. My team right now is talking about who do we line up with? Um, what kind of network do we create? Who, who can we ex invite to our family? And who wants to be a part of a mission? Whereby, and this is my mission, and I want to make it yours too, brother, is, is I want to go out there and really get a thousand people, just to start, a thousand people right with money, wealth, and worth. And I'll get into that definition in a moment why I keep citing those three terms. 
so that we can really alter the trajectory in their life and financial futures. Because right now we're heading into some seriously turbulent times. So before I go into a, into a rant, that's the point. So we are going to blow it up, but it's because we're really clear as to, as to, to the problem I want to solve for people. And I, and I just want to clear, I want to just have a clear path at that one challenge. And there is nothing that's going to detract me from doing that. I don't need to be famous. I'm not doing it for the fame. My ego is super healthy and I appreciate a compliment once in a while, but I've got, I've got what I've got to have handled handled because I'm just going to do this to be in service. I believe that service trumps showmanship. And I think that's what this industry needs right now. Service trumps showmanship. Enough talking, enough showcasing, enough, 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 enough of this razzle dazzle. Let's get <laughs> to it. What's the problem that you've got that if it was removed or handled, your life would be absolutely lit up? Let's, let's do that inside the domain of money, wealth, and worth. So, um, so brother, I'm inviting you to the stable, man. We're going to do something together. <laughs> Richard, if you don't mind. Me, my, me digressing for a second. I, I actually, um, I studied uh, your buddy, Larry King. I saw you guys did an interview together. I, I studied friend. him when I started doing all this stuff. And it was, this was all new to me. And um, I agree with his principle where basically you interview the person, let them speak the whole time. Over the, over the months, though, I've, I've been kind of tweaking it a little bit and realizing it's, it's, it's actually a perfect opportunity to network. So if you don't mind, I think that I, I just want to jump in with what you said and just tell you something real quick. So, Please. you know, I, I had three books. I was university professor for 10 years and I sat in the universities with my books and I know I can change the world with, I got knowledge in there that, that has completely revolutionized the two sciences, but I'm not getting any traction. And I became a product of my own teaching and marketing was my enemy, was my deficiency. And when I, when I got to the point where I retired about a few years ago, I said, I need to master marketing because that is my weakness here. I, I know everything about, well, I know a lot about finance, but I don't know how to apply marketing. And that's why if I don't apply marketing, I'll never get my message out there. I'll be Christopher Columbus, who never went back to Spain and recorded the new world. And we wouldn't be here, right? Like what good is discovery if you don't share it with everyone else? So I got to figure out a way to get my message. And like you, I also, I don't, I don't want to like be famous. I don't, I don't want any of this stuff, right? I, I don't want like fortune. I don't even care about that. Really. And money was never really my, my number one. It was serving other people. That's why I was a financial planner for, for poor people. You know, That's why I was a university professor for 10 years. I was an educator. So I didn't care about the money. But there's a point where you reach where if you really want to help people, you got to, and this is what I, my own soul searching. I had this realize I need to make a lot of money and I need to get fame. Not for me, myself. It's for my people that I need to help out. You see my colors here for Ukraine. So, uh, the point of back going back to what we're talking about here is I just want to tell you <clears throat> when I got that message and COVID really pushed me over the line and said, okay, I'm going to do this. So in a matter of less than a year or so, I'd say roughly a year and a half, um, I've already told you. So YouTube almost, I think I hit over 8 million views today. Okay. Over a million Facebook followers. Uh, Clubhouse won the top host there. I, I've, I started a room that had impacted over a million people, over a million people from the room I started. It was the longest running room in Clubhouse, 84 days straight, over a million people. All these different platforms and, and the different people I've interviewed on this podcast, Les Brown, who got paid 225,000 an hour, he sat on here for two hours and plus and came on my stage for two hours. So that's a million dollars. Just for who am I? Like, why are you doing it for me, right? I figured this out. And I'm telling you this because I see you in the similar situation. You have a background that's deep and you can help a lot of people what, what you're missing. And I've already did your, I did all my marketing stuff on you and pretend that I was you. And I've already made my assessment. What you're missing is you just, you need a little bit better marketing. So if I can help out in any way, shape or form, that's not what I want to do in life at all. But if I can help you as a friend, you know, I'd be happy to, to, to I, do that. I, I want to just make a note to myself before I forget it. And um, that's just probably old age creeping up on me, but I want to just make sure I identify something. For, first of all, you, you, you recognize where you were weak and needed development and you became a student of that, what you needed to learn. So that's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's what people need to do. Often what they'll do is like, look, let me hire someone to do this and hire someone to do that. So, so you learned. And, and so congratulations on, on all those achievements, but, but, but for the sake of those listening in um, and, and for those watching, what, what, what I know I've been very resistant to is marketing as it's an extension of salesmanship. And what I rather, based on the way I'm built and how I was groomed, is I'd like to resolve for people. 
something rather than sell them the solution and trust they'll apply it. So the difference, and it may just be semantics, but I'd rather go from uh, having a marketing plan to having a movement plan. And I think the world sees that now. What yeah, you and I share moving. in common yeah. is, is that we're getting closer to the end for a average of more than we ever have in the history of mankind. There, a baby boomer turns 70 every seven seconds in this world. And, and, and the biggest challenge that they've got is like, oh my God, will I have enough as I live longer? Did I save enough? Have I invested enough? Will I have enough income? And I got to tell you that where they got the advice and where they actually laid the original plans may not be enough. It may not. I'm not saying it was wrong. I'm not saying it's disconnected, but I'm not sure. And I, but, but I rather have a plan B. So I think where we're in alignment, which is why I'm really open to having these conversations with anyone that's recognizing the need to be a part of something that's bigger than the person who catalyzes it to say that really this movement needs to outlive me. Getting people's relationship right with money, wealth, and worth needs to outlive me. And, and because that's where true legacy is created. It's, it's being able to cause and create the trajectory of something that outlives you, that, that actually lasts longer than the time you're here on the planet. And I think that's what you and I are going to have in common, bro. I'm with you, Rich. Appreciate that, man. All right, Rich, for the respect of your time, um, I want to move on to the next question. And, and again, I definitely got a note here. I'm, I'm going to be buying that Mike Tyson. I'm going to buy a tenant. <laughs> I love it. Well, I got you. I got you. All right. Uh, what is it like to serve as the president of Canada's longest running private real estate group, REIN? And, you know, that, that's another cool part of you. So you have, you have many diff different levels of accomplishments. That's another one. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I mean, I got to tell you, when, when, when I was the president and co-owner of the longest running investment club for real estate in the world, um, it was an honor. I mean, it was a time when I just came off of working with Tony Robbins for quite some time. I finished up touring with the likes of a President Clinton for quite some time. Um, I had just begun to wrap up a, a series of tours with Oprah Winfrey uh, for quite some time. I wanted to really focus on getting back to the thing that I was really lit up about, which was helping people get their relationship right with money. Mm -hmm. But in that game, given what Rain was doing, Rain was the big dominant force in helping people get into real estate. And even though it was the right field, I still always felt I was in the wrong position. Mm -hmm. So yes, I was the president. Yes, I was the co-owner and my partner at the time. Patrick, who was the CEO, we were an amazing team doing that work. But I also recognized that I was I was kicking a ball when I knew I needed to throw it. I, I, I so I was on the I, I may have been on the right pitch, but I was playing the wrong game. But I wrestled with that for a long time. So a good eight years go by, and out of that, um, what I had done was I resigned as the president. I I relinquished my uh, interest in the company, out of creating a new company inside that ecosystem called legacy. Because what I was really lit up about, and here it comes, is really helping people get right responsibly with their financial lives and futures by doing things that the industry had not really done a lot of work on. Self-assessment, self-discovery, uh, self-profiling, just to name a few, getting one's financial lives organized and, and prepared and the like. But what catalyzed it, and here comes one of the most profound small anecdotes that I can share in this entire conversation as I know our time is winding down is that at around that time when legacy was being formed, I knew there had to be a new type of life coach that focused on money, focused on wealth, focused on world at worth. At that time when I was just bringing it together, two incredible women passed in my life. It was my wife's mother and it was my own grandmother, the one I talked about earlier on, the woman that was right. my rock. And they died in the exact same year. I appreciate that. Now, what's interesting, though, is that my mother-in-law, Clara, she, in her dying moment, said to her daughter, my wife, said, look, eh, 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 you know, you look up in the, the closet and you'll see a green Samsonite uh, suitcase. You open it very carefully. And inside is everything, tropa bona, tropa tutta tutta, everything, uh, cento per cento, everything you need. Okay? Capito? Okay, ciao. And boom, she was gone. God bless her. God rest her soul. Truly a powerful woman. Now, when we opened the suitcase, Tony, everything was in there. Will, her last, I mean, everything. 
keys to her lockers, cards with passwords. I mean, people to call to sell her con. I mean, it was she, it was like she was preparing for this for months. Everything was in there. No need to look for anything. No need to search for anything. And of course, we settled her estate. Now, my other grandmother, who hails from South America, not so organized. And true, she kind of suddenly passed, but she was ill for quite some time. To this day, we're still finding out things about she having a little bit of money squirreled away here, or she had a couple of debts over there. And, and, and I mean, there to this day, there's storage lockers that we still never got into, things we couldn't access, things we're still discovering as if we're on a treasure hunt. She was not prepared. So what we know is preparation is a courageous act to prepare for the inevitable, but we just don't do it. So in that anecdote, I really felt inspired by helping people just get their financial lives organized, prepared, and clear. So Legacy started this movement of really helping people create a great financial life. Now, we all have a financial life, and it's good, and it may operate, but a great financial life, and here it comes, is one that is whole, complete, and performing. And so we designed a whole bunch of proprietary tools that anybody can use in any language, both digital and hard copy, that can get people really truly prepared for the inevitable. So that way they're organized. It's the most responsible thing for them to do. So to this day, my son knows what I have, where it is sitting in a uh, waterproof container in a fireproof box. So that if anything were to happen, that's the black box to look for because in there is everything that he would need of his parents should anything were to happen, heaven forbid. Mm, that's that's so, a brilliant idea. Yeah, so it's a cool it's a cool story. So Legacy to this day um, operates in over five countries. We have a network of financial life professionals around the world that are people like you and me, people who uh, are, are, are authors, they're coaches, they're mentors. Uh, some of those people are even just ordinary people who want to get their own lives and, and their family lives straight financially. But, but, but as a result, what's happening is that money mentorship and financial coaching is now this new conversation that people want to get equipped for. And we are super stoked to have been the first company in the world that created a brand new academia, a brand new curricula. And from one visiting professor to a retired one, you get this, that progressive learning where people can learn and get things done is exactly the way adults need to be dealt with mm -hmm. so that we can start and we can finish. We can graduate and complete something and say, wow, I really shifted the needle in that domain of my life. So um, delighted at the work. We're, we're really happy with the impact it's making and we're just getting started. That's incredible, Richard. And if you don't mind, I just want, I just want to add something. Uh, going back to the, your role with, the, with Rain, um, most people that were in that position would probably at some point be content because that's such an incredible position. Like that's a, a pinnacle for the average person to be there, to be an executive at that level. And for you to leave and go somewhere else, um, I suspect that your purpose is just so off the chart, kind of like mine, where it's just, you just got to the point where you're like, <laughs> there's so much, so much more bigger I got to do. Like you, you can't, you must've hit that, that, that point that I was talking about earlier, another one of those out of the, the, the yeah. 20, that another point where it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, there's something in me that's telling me to go further. Cause you just don't stop a position like that unless you have some kind of extremely driving force behind you that you can't really explain that well. Yeah, you're, you're right, man. I mean, if anyone's writing down notes, I would want you to write something down. And that is that complacency is the killer. Complacency is a killer. And, and, and for me, uh, it broke my heart. I mean, I had to say goodbye to hundreds and hundreds, thousands of members that were incredibly loyal to our company, most of which are still at reign to this day. But, but for me, it was kind of like I, I really just outgrew my, my little town, if it were. And uh, I outgrew it, and I just knew that I had to go. And, um, and it was something that was tough. And to this day, when I talk about it, it is tough. It's tough because I left behind a lot of really good people I cared about and a lot of people that counted on me and a lot of people I looked forward to seeing. Um, but as my, as my journey took me through and into uh, an interaction with Grant Cardone for a good couple of years, and of course, uh, surviving the pandemic as we did, I, I've been building my, my brand, my curricula, my academia, my IP in such a way that it's going to serve 
the greater purpose that I've now caused and created for myself. So, so had it, had it not been for me leaving uh, the small town of rain, if I may say, and I say that respectfully, um, I wouldn't be here now where I'm on a global stage uh, being sought out by incredible people, leaders, icons, brands. Uh, I mean, as an advisor to some incredible companies around the world, where, where in, inside of all of that, I'm building out the, the Richard 2.0. Mm. And uh, and I've, I've slowly begun to launch, and you've so eloquently pointed out that marketing is what's missing. So it's it's kind of like again, I'm an off Broadway show that just, just, we just got to work out a couple more kinks, and then we'll go to Broadway. We'll let all the big lights come on us, but we're we're almost there. We'll cross the street shortly. <laughs> and um, just to quote John Lee on Clubhouse, John Lee's a big marketing guy over there. Everybody knows about. It. He's uh, he's got like six million followers or something. He said the best known beats the best. And I don't know if that's his line, but I heard it from him. And um, that's sort of what we're talking about here, right? Like you're, you, you are probably one of the best at what you do, if not the best. But without getting known, it's all, it's all useless. Well, well it, it, but it depends on what game you're playing. I mean, again, as I said before, if, if I am and remain to be the best paying customer I'll ever have, I'm okay with that. Right. It makes, it makes me a happy uh, peaceful and and grateful person. It makes my son uh, feel proud of of me as a dad, but but for me to be a father, it equips me to live my best life. So so yes, best known beats the best, but it's just not the game I was playing right now. What I know is that if if I were to go toe to toe, pound for pound, and I say this to a fellow combatter, um, I have zero zero concern for entering a ring with anybody. In, in the domain of, of really causing transformation in the world of someone's life, especially in particularly in this domain of getting people's relationship right with money. But, but you know, I've, I've studied, understand, and really, and, and really appreciate human performance. I, I understand and have gathered incredible insight around what it means to have leadership. I mean, I remain a Google partner working with Google to this day, eight years later, where I've got a digital advisory company that helps celebrity brands and iconic brands understand whether they need to pivot, turn right rather than left because of my uh, celebrity equity digital intelligence. Um, and I know that in the world of money and wealth, I've been in that space for now three decades and I've worked with family offices, billionaires, institutions and endowment funds and understand how money behaves. Um, everyone from being poor, which I was uh, for a long period of my life to being wealthy. And the things that matter. So what's nice is I, I have a, it's almost like I feel like I'm the most equipped mixed martial arts guy <laughs> that needs to enter an octagon. And I'm okay because I've got like eight great skills that get along so well. And I can't wait to get in the octagon. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, oh, yeah. I'm ready for anything that can come at me. <laughs> I love anyway. Thank you, Rich. That was a great analogy. All right, Rich. So next question, how does someone get gifted? And, and you're going to correct me on this. Two NBA championship rings. I just found out something before we started today. Well, I mean, look, we all have these really great uh, runoff stories and, and, and departures. I mean, we can talk about what you did uh, uh, this summer or that March break or when you went up uh, north with the family or on that road trip. And there's always these outlier stories, right? All these outlier stories that don't seem to be a real true uh, part of your main focus or journey but was an absolute pleasant compliment to your journey. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so following a real, truly accidental bump in, I, I met Juwan Howard during a dinner with my family uh, in Miami during a vacation, uh, right when they were entering the playoffs. That was the first season LeBron James was playing for the Miami Heat. So it was what was called the big three. It was, uh, you know, Chris Bosh and D Wade and well, LeBron James. And so after his controversial exit from Cleveland, I mean, to be quite honest, I wasn't really following the heat at that time, but I was a fan of Jawan Howard being the big fab five guy, the, the, the guy who got the hundred million dollar contract before even uh, Michael Jordan did. Uh, this was the guy that put Michigan U on the map and who to this day actually is now the head coach there at Michigan U, which is a real great part to his legacy. But in meeting him by chance, um, the way the story goes, is uh, I walked up to him and said, look, I'm a big fan, Michigan U, uh, Fab Five, uh, good luck in the playoffs. But when you are ready to retire, I'd love to talk to you about getting in the money game in a very big and meaningful way. Whatever happened, we clicked. 
And so he goes, yo, man, I'm going to call you then. So I gave him my card. And like a schoolboy, I sat by the phone for three days on my vacation. He never called. So I fly back home. And sure enough, when I arrive, I get a phone call and it's Jawan Howard. He's like, what's up, man? I'm like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, hey, listen, you, you want to have coffee tomorrow? I'm going to be in uh, the South Beach area. This particular time, I got a window there. Why don't you and I hook up for a cup of coffee? I said, you got it, man. So I get down there. We sit uh, side by side in his car, his Ferrari. We ordered a couple of Tazo chai lattes, which is what he drank at the time. And we spent two hours just talking. I said, man, this has been the most profound conversation. We talked about life and life after game and what he wanted to start thinking about and looking at. It was just, it was just profound. Goes, so what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, you know, once we're done, I'm just going to get back to the airport and fly back home. And he goes, fly back to the airport. He goes, where'd you come from? I said, well, Toronto, that's, that's where I live. And he said, you mean to say you flew down here to have a coffee with me? I said, that's <laughs> right, man. I flew down here just to have a coffee with you. He goes, man, you stay here tonight as my guest. You come to the game. You watch us beat Boston. I want you to meet some fellas. And, and, and that night changed everything for me because I, I was a part of now the Juwan Howard family. And for those who are listening and who don't know, Juwan Howard, his beautiful wife, Janine Howard, and the entire family, all of them are a remarkable representation of what it means to have human heart. Uh, they, they adopted me the minute I saw them. Uh, they go on to beat the Boston Celtics that night. Went out to dinner with the team and I was in love. Tony, I was in love. I, I guess I must have been starstruck. I'm like, man, I love hanging out with these guys. Never had experience with professional athletes before. And so uh, that year they lose the Dallas Mavericks, which I witnessed in person. And that summer I spent a lot of time talking to various members of the Miami Heat. And uh, without citing who in particular were thinking about, you know, quitting the sport, retiring or moving on, uh, they all returned the following year to win their first championship. And so as a result of my role as a friend and advisor to Juwan, he, he awarded me my, my, not only my first NBA championship ring, but the, the very first championship ring that Chris Bosh would win, that LeBron James would win, that he himself would win. So we went on to win two more championships uh, together. So I got the back-to-back -back rings, which is fantastic. I was the first Canadian at that time that had any championship rings in Canada because the, the Toronto Raptors hadn't had one yet. And uh, I stayed with him while he was an assistant coach. Uh, until his departure, um, his ultimate retirement from the NBA, he headed off to Michigan U as a coach. And, and then I circled back with, with LeBron's team, uh, headed up by Mike Mancy as their chief performance officer, uh, teamed back up so that when they won their bubble ring uh, in 2020, uh, I was awarded a championship ring uh, from, from Mike. So, so that was fantastic. So I got a ring from him and I got a ring oh, from So you were, I'm sorry to interrupt, you were, you were actually on the team. You, you, you were part well, of that. I was, I was, I mean, all, all teams have players, which I'm clearly not, yeah. um, not, not tall enough nor young enough. Um, and then all teams have coaches, all teams have trainers, all teams uh, have consultants and consultants uh, vary in performance, nutrition, wellness, uh, mindset, et cetera. So, so I've provided a lot of, a lot of uh, performance coaching to uh, F1 drivers, NBA players, um, boxers, as we now know. And uh, in other celebrity professional athletes, Olympic champions. I mean, I, I've, I've been able to really be a great asset. Now, between us, that was a really wonderful sort of side gig because I got to really play in a, a domain that I wasn't very familiar with, but I understand performance. I understand if you want to write down a note that the best way to get a result is to stop chasing them. Mm -hmm. The best way to get a result is stop chasing them. You want to become the source of results. And when you become the source of results, Everything is a result, but most people spend a lot of time chasing results. So for me, understanding the laws of performance, whether in money or business and such, I just took it and clearly applied it in the world of sports. So um, that was a really tremendous time, really cool run and uh, delighted now to, to, to call a lot of basketball players, friends and now family. Thank you, Rich. That, that is incredible. Incredible. So you yeah. got three NBA championship rings. That's awesome. All right, next, que next question, Rich, uh, maybe just a minute or so. If you wanted to connect with a celebrity, not in your circle, what would be your steps and, and, and how long would it, would it take? So let's say you want to find somebody that you have no connection with, you're in third degree connection, uh, LinkedIn terms at this point. Like how, how do you get to them? What, what steps, how long do you think it'll take? Six months, a year? A I mean, it all, it, all, it all depends. I mean, the, the, real, the real challenge is figuring out the right context. You know, why, why are you connecting with a celebrity? I mean, that, that's the reality. I've, I've contacted celebrities quite coldly, um, you know, connected through social media with them. Um, 
or or made a made a real blind call and somehow got connected with uh, the person in charge or the celebrity themselves. The, the majority of the time that I've connected, I do mean like ninety nine percent of the time that I've connected with a celebrity, it's because um, I bumped into them. There, there was a physical exchange of some kind, and I think a big part of the reason why I bump into so many is because I'm in the places in which celebrities are in. You know, so I'm either in the same hotel they are, I'm at the same restaurant they are, uh, or I go to their game, or I go to their performance, or I go watch, et cetera, and on and on it goes. So, so proximity is the key. You know, you've got to be in the places that celebrities are. And um, unless they're in a place that they've been paid to be there, then you're getting in the way of those who paid them to be there. You don't want to interrupt that either. That's a bit dishonorable. Um, you know, poaching a celebrity because someone else paid the bill to have that celebrity there and present. And now all of a sudden you're, you know, you're kind of mowing someone else's lawn, so to speak. So I don't thought that was the right analogy to use, but I think you get the point. So, so for me, it's proximity. It's, it's about proximity. It's about approaching them in the places and the times that you're in. And I guess lucky for me, I, I am very fortunate for myself to be able to stay in hotels or to dine in places that celebrities are in. So you want to get to know where do celebrities go? And, and go there too. Go there often. Go there as often as you can. Uh, it's not like I go to the same restaurants all the time, hoping that a celebrity walks through the door, you know. <laughs> um, but when when one does, I take advantage. I mean, just the other day, Lakers are in Toronto. I take my son to watch the game. Uh, I host another couple of my friends, business partners of mine. And uh, post game, we end up going out for a little post drink, you know, so to speak, a little 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 nightcap. So my son's cool. He's fifteen. And he's chilling with a couple of guys, and uh, but sitting literally behind me is is uh the weekend and uh nav i mean two major hip-hop artists and a whole entourage of theirs so you got to first think to yourself you know what are the odds of me being in the restaurant that there's 300 seats and i'm sat at a table directly across from these celebrities <laughs> so i think a big a big part of it is a little bit of synchronicity a little bit of a holy intervention if i may say right some of us call that luck but the second point is my son now says to me, he goes, dad, you know who's sitting right behind you? I was like, no, I have no idea. He goes, that dude right there, his name is Nav, N-A-V. I said, I don't know him, never recognized him. He goes, no, dude, dad, you bumped to his music. I'm like, what do you mean by bump to his music? He goes, no, dad, you, you hear his music. He, he collaborates with Travis uh, Scott, Kendrick Lamar, uh, Drake. I mean, he's huge and on the up and up. I'm like, okay, so why are you telling me that? He goes, I'd love to shake his hand and take a picture with him. I said, okay, cool. So chill out and let's uh, let's enjoy our dessert. Let's have a little drink. And uh, you know, you tap that Shirley Temple and I'll have my, uh, my son. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll get to it. My colleague beside me goes, listen, I'll, I'll get up and ask him for a picture. I said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Just trust me. So of course I end up then at the end of our moment, I get up, I walk over. And I simply just, I actually always approach celebrities in three, in, in three ways and in this order. N number one is I actually first apologize profusely for interrupting anybody because clearly I am an interruption in their time, in their space, in their, in their world. So I, I, I address the table, the people he might be engaged with or that person themselves and say, I'm just really sorry that I'm interrupting in any way, shape or form. I don't mean to be rude. Um, you know, call that Canadian, call that polite, but I think you can never exercise enough grace you got to know that when you interrupt people, you're you're interrupting people. Uh, number two is, as I said, look, um, I want you to know that for a living, what I do is I advise uh, celebrities and legends like you. And I recognize there might be some value I might be able to add in your world. So if there's ever a time that we can connect, how do I best reach you? Just like that. And he goes, well, here, why don't you take my number? I'm like, cool, I'll take your number. Next thing you know, manager's calling across the table. Oops, calling across the table and says, hey, take my number down too. Okay, cool. But then the third but then the third, I get quick to it. And I say, hey, listen, my son's dying to take a picture with you. If you said no, all would have, I will be hung. So you can say no, but I will be hung. So if you're okay with it, would you mind? He goes, absolutely. He comes on over, takes a picture of my son. And so we're leaving. My son then says to me, dad, that was fantastic. Thank you. My friends, my colleagues that were with me saying, well, what, what, what did you do? How did you get him to take the picture? Like, what did you say? My son says, my dad didn't go for a picture. He went looking for an opportunity. He just left with a picture for now. How observant, and he's right. So for a lot of us, we always are looking to get something from a celebrity, take something from a celebrity, take their picture for sure, post it when we can. I mean, take, 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 take. Do you know how many other people are taking from celebrities today? Everybody. Mm. Everyone's hands are in a celebrity's pocket. You've got to give them something. 
And if you're not in a position to give them something of any kind, don't expect asking them of anything. And if you do, don't be disappointed when they say no, because maybe their account for the day, their withdrawal limit is at its max. Mm -hmm. It's possible. And that's happened to me before. I've had celebrities say no. I've had bad interactions with celebrities that says, no, um, I'm calling the police. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I mean, for me, truthfully, uh, I also see it as a bit of a, a bit of a game. I mean, life's a game, man, is, isn't it, Tony? As we wind this conversation down, uh, given that we all got so much going on, but I mean, life's a game and you got to play it. So the worst thing a celebrity is going to say to me is no, right? The worst thing that can happen is I don't get what I'm looking for. But so what? I got to ask. I got to play. And regardless of who's around me, and believe me, sometimes I'm around people who will say, don't do that. Don't interrupt. Don't be, don't be rude. Don't be this. Don't be that. It's like, well, hold, hold on. Don't do that. Let me live my life. You live your life. If you're embarrassed, then you can leave. But, and that's why I wait till the end. Because sometimes if you go too early, whether you're at a restaurant or in a bar or in a moment, and you go too soon and you get a no, it's very uncomfortable for everybody. Yeah. Because now you didn't get what you want. You feel bad. They didn't give you what you asked for. They feel bad. Now everyone feels bad. That's bad energy. Yeah. So I always wait to the last possible minute so that I don't leave a bad sort of stink in the room if, 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 if it doesn't go the way you want it to. Um, be short. Be pleasant. Don't get starstruck. Don't ask for more than you can actually pay back for. Just, just, just go for what you got to go for and nothing more. And that would probably be my shorter answer. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. That, no, that's a brilliant, brilliant response. Um, and, and just real quickly, an extension of that, we could also extend it to the virtual world too. So you mastered the physical setting. Um, I, I, I didn't do any of that stuff. I actually, most of my celebrities I connected with were on virtual platforms. So if you're in the right room, like Clubhouse, I'm in the right room rooms every week with these people. That's how I'm meeting these people. Like they're coming in my room. Like, you know, it's, so it's the same idea. I mean, think about it. We're here right now because I met C-Rock through a virtual platform, had an interview with him. And then he connected me to you. We, we actually expanded beyond the clubhouse to telephone and all this other stuff. And then now I'm, I'm seeing you on a live forum all virtually. We never hung out, like had coffee, neither see Rock. He lives an hour from me, half hour from me, you know, like he lives close to Philly. But, but, but just to interrupt, uh, if I may be so rude, yeah, and Canadian, I'll say this though, is that, is that that all is true, but when it comes to celebrities, they have to be dealt with differently. And it's, it's a very slippery slope where, where you can really truly mistreat a celebrity. Believe me, I have, and I, and I regret it, but I learned from it. And that's why I think I've perfected my approach and, and truly appreciate their role in place and purpose on this planet. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, there are definitely moments where I wish I did more and asked for more and probably could have, but I chose not to because I wanted to just really honor the space and wait and trust that there was another time. Um, when it comes to individuals like you and I connecting the way we did, which is miraculous. And of course, how all of us uh, who just wanted to start coming out of uh, obscurity, yeah, come out of obscurity. Life's to be lived and experienced out here, not inside your head, not, not behind uh, a remote control, not on your couch or the lazy boy. Life is meant to be experienced out, lived out fully from the outside in. And so, um, so you're right. I mean, digitally hooking up with people, I do hit people up in IG. If there's people that I'm really impressed by and want to connect with, I'll write them directly. Uh, but I still practice the humility, the grace. Uh, I keep the asks short and sweet. And, um, and, then, and, then you, and then it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't cost you a darn thing to be nice after it, to thank them, to be, to be grateful, to, to just thank them. Thank you. Like, thank you. I mean, people think that just because they're celebrities, they owe us something. I mean, they done paying their dues, right? They appeared on that film. They already performed on the stage. Um, they're just human beings getting through life. But when it comes to us, just it's the same practice. You know, you've got to be everywhere if you want to be um, on top. And you said it here, right? Best known beats the best. Mm. And you That's and I great. both know. You and I both know that now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Brilliant, Thanks, brilliant. Man. All right, Rich. So maybe 30 seconds. Next question. What is more important, academic or street education? I think both. I think it's a combination of both. I think both are also defined as both uh, science and magic. I mean, it's uh, there, there's definite rules and there's definite techniques and skills you must learn, adhere to, and, and fundamentally build into your, your, your ethos, right? Into your, into your DNA. Um, but there's also a little bit of magic. There's a little bit of like, you know, hitting the streets and learning for yourself. That's, that's, that, that's where it all happens, being able to apply it. 
Life's, life provides you endless streams of playgrounds and you just got to realize that you get to play. But, but at some point you got to realize that you get to play to, to, to live, not play to lose. And so um, I think it's the combination of the two. And I'm teaching that to my son right now. There's, there's things out there in the world that you can't learn in school, but there's things in school you got to learn to appreciate and leverage what you'll learn out in life. Um, so they have to go hand in hand. I love it. That's great. Brilliant answer. Um, who's your favorite character from the movie Wall Street? I would, I would have to say that my favorite character has, has got to be uh, Martin Sheen. I mean, maybe my ego would love to say Gordon Gecko because of the flash and who he was. I mean, heck, you might even want to say uh, Charlie Sheen, um, you know, for, for, for who he became, you know, for, for Fox, right, for him to Bud Fox, who, um, you know, ended up having a big revelation, a big eureka, a big regret where he, he climbed and then realized it wasn't what he thought it was. But what I love about Martin Sheen, the father to Bud Fox, is he remained steady through the whole mm, thing. He, he, he remained a dad. He remained a mentor. Uh, he remained true to the union. He remained true to his members of his union. He spoke his mind. He spoke his truth. And in the end, not to spoil it for everybody, he still showed up for his son. In spite of all that went wrong and went down, uh, for the trust that, that Bud, his son, broke, and for all of, of what went wrong in, in that world, uh, he still showed up as his dad. And that, that, to me, I think was the most important person in the whole movie. Brilliant response. Thank you, Rich. What do you like to do for fun? Maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> That's a tough one. I think for guys <laughs> like you and I who feel like we're running out of time and we got so much to do, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting that, you know, I love to read and, and I definitely love uh, spending time with my family. Uh, but, but, but for me, I'm a definite audiophile movie guy. I love to just let my mind unplug because it's always thinking. So, so what I really love doing is I definitely love to escape into film. That's why I love doing a little bit of work in that world where uh, I appreciate a great film. I appreciate the, my theater. I appreciate the darkness, the turning off the phone, getting disconnected and, and, and relocating yourself in a different time, a different era, a different story, a different plot, and just, just witness someone else's life, whether it's fiction or fact, and just experiencing something else different than what we do every day. Um, Cause definitely we, we all live a different type of drama and fantasy every day. So um, that's what I definitely do for fun. That's a great, great response. Great. Re By the way, I grew up in a video store. People don't even know what videotapes are these days. <laughs> I grew up in a video store, so I was always had access to uh, watching the new releases that were coming. But, but the real question is, did you have a special part of the video store that only the adults were allowed? I can't tell that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think Let's about that. I had access to all parts of the room. <laughs> think about that growing up i would look at that room and say dad what's behind those beads and he's like never <laughs> mind son never mind all right um wow we're really we're really pushing the envelope today i love it all right so next question um any relation to the ufo expert his name is richard dolan and the reason i also want to ask you this because when i was doing research when this guy's name kept popping up and i know that sea rock is a big uh alien guy he always talks about seeing aliens and all this crazy stuff um but uh, just and he introduced me to you. So I, I'm making these two connections. And I'm wondering. And when, when my mom first discovered Google and she started getting the handle of things, she called me one day out of the blue and she goes, son, I didn't know. I said, what do you mean? I didn't know. She goes, I didn't know. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I didn't know that you are a UFO guy. I'm like, ma, that's not me. It's a mother, Richard Dolan. She goes, oh, I didn't know. So uh, you're right. There, there is a very world famous. I mean, I share the name with a number of Richard Dolans out there, and I'm so grateful to share it because of um, what it means for a lot of other very famous people. But for that particular guy, he, he is the world's leading expert on UFOs. And so it's kind of um, it's kind of synchronistic. But no, there's no relation. I'm not related. Uh, and I don't study UFOs. Not yet. And, and just just for the marketing uh, purposes, I added that question. Just going to just going to interject a little lesson today. So uh, people are going to be listening to this, thinking that they were going to listen to the other Richard Dolan. So for you people out there, I got you. April Fool's Day is around the corner. But we got a, we got a great Richard Dolan here. And when this shows up on the YouTube videos uh, many thousands of times, just remember, you need to learn about business. <laughs> so thank right. you, Richard. Thank you. That's a little, little trick there. All right, cool. So uh, who is more powerful, the influencer or the hidden power behind the influencer? I think <clears throat> I think the influencer is always going to be caused and created by the influencer that influenced them. I mean, you can it, to just really kind of pare that down. I mean, what's more powerful, the forest fire or the match that lit it? 
I mean, so, so really when you look at the originating moment, the originating catalyst, I mean, that, that to me is the source. So when you get to the source, you get the purity of whatever it is that power embodies, whether you're learning a, a martial arts or you're learning a new recipe, the closer you, you are to its origination, uh, the more clearer and the more crisp uh, the source of knowledge or inspiration or power is. So I would have to say that the, uh, the inspiration behind the influencer uh, is definitely someone to, to examine. To follow the logic of what you just said, would you say that Ip Man is more powerful than Bruce Lee? Uh, what Ip, was the Ip first Man name? Being, Ip, Ip Man said. is the teacher for Bruce uh, Lee. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. I mean, he he was you know Bruce Bruce. It's, it's almost like John Gotti made being a mobster famous. <laughs> um, but but the reality is that yeah, Bruce Lee made famous uh, martial arts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, karate and kung fu. For Ip Man, Ip Man is the original source, but I'd love to know where Ip Man got that from. Yeah. Um, to really appreciate the power of, of the baseline of originating foundational intelligence. Because you see, I'll say this just really quickly. Every time, every time I learn something, I teach it according to me, through my values, through my views, through my life experiences. Once you learn them, you're learning them according to your view, your values, your opinions on life. And then when you speak it out, you're speaking it out in the world from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But your, your learning this will be different from if I were to teach this to 100 different people around the world, depending on where they are and what they come from, it, it will land with people differently and therefore taught differently. So the further back you can get to the originating source, you find the source. But the magic of, of the heritage of what you learn is that it goes through so many different transformations because of all the people that interact with it. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what you want to really get to, right? You want to, you want to get that from... I mean, if you want to learn how to golf, you know, get taught by a scratch golfer. Don't emulate Uncle Bill who hits 101 every time. You, mm. want, you want to get as close to the net result you want. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate that. Excellent question. Oh, uh, Rich, I just want to get a quick check on your time. I got, I got about 10 questions here. If we can get it done in like 30 seconds, we can, we can be good. But I want to check on your time, though. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's bang this out inside the next five minutes then. Okay. All right. I don't know if we can do that, but let's try. Um, why, why would you pay someone to introduce a well-known speaker? Possible, I had here, possible opportunity for a clubhouse stage to monetize. So so I, I was referring to, you, you had, I, I listened to your story on how you got um, to be on the stage with Bill Clinton. So you paid to be a sponsor there. And um, so you showed up and that really, as you said, that was the highlighting point where it really shifted your direction. How, how did, why would someone want to do that? Though? Why would they want to pay to be a sponsor? And I'm thinking in terms of Clubhouse, because I haven't seen anyone that's really been able to monetize it without directly to their own brand at this point. Even Kevin Harrington built out on that. Like, and he's the guy who created the infomercial. I'm just yeah. trying to figure out how that could be, how you can integrate that. I mean, at the, at the time in which I was you know, sponsoring my way through and across great speaking tours, uh, it was at a time that very few people were. So the, the real profound privilege for me was few were, few people were doing what I was doing. Yeah. And so, and, I, and, and few people were doing it with the legendary characters that I got to do it with. Many of those names I've already cited and many, many more I haven't even cited. I mean, they're just profound, profound individuals in the world. I'm so glad. Um, and I think that now that a lot of PR agencies, managers and the like, are all realizing that thanks to the social media, they've, they've opened up some access to some of these celebrities. It's now a business where a lot more celebrities can be hired to come to your event, hired to come to your clubhouse. So I think what's more powerful that I recognize is I can call any, any of those people and call in a favor for them to come for free for me. And I've done that. I've had a, a, a podcast myself. It's lasted four seasons. We've already filmed the past, uh, the fifth season called Courageous Conversations. Where I've had Mike Tyson come. I've had Larry King show up before he passed. God bless him. I've had the, the Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, show up. I've, I've had such incredible people that came for me. Vitor Belfort, the, the youngest UFC champion in the world. Um, Marlon Wayans. And, and, and I mean, uh, David Hasselhoff, my childhood hero, Knight Rider. I mean, such great celebrities who came for me. So I think what the world is beginning to move towards a little bit is like, look, Obviously, these celebrities are here because someone paid them. I want to see what kind of relationship you have with them. And I think they're looking for a little bit more of the authenticity and genuineness than ever before. So I think there's nothing wrong with paying for celebrities to attend events. I think it's, it's a fantastic idea. 
uh, providing that they provide great value and they're going to provide great insights that you're going to learn from and be inspired by. But uh, as far as your question about Clubhouse, I mean, people should pay for introductions or being a part of very well populated rooms because they're getting exposure. I mean, I, I really broke onto the scene because of Grant Cardone. I owe a lot of my early momentum as now my own brand because of Grant Cardone. Because of Grant Cardone, I got to enter a stage that he provided me to grow his brand globally. I, in turn, got to launch mine. And that was a great quid pro quo and uh, an experience I'm super grateful for. And I'm happy to call him a friend. So. In That's the, the next qu question, Rich, before you yeah. go in there. So that, uh, how did you meet Grant Cardone? I pursued Grant Cardone to get the Canadian rights to his brand in Canada um, at a time that I thought that's the only place I was going to be. Uh, I finally met really the brains behind the operation, which is Jared Glant. That's a little secret. Don't let that get out. But I mean, Jared Glant is, is the world heavyweight champion of running that company. Wow. I mean, he's backed by an incredible woman named Sherry Hamilton, who's equally powerful, by the way. Um, but my working relationship was largely with Jared. But uh, Jared and I really clicked and we really saw a global opportunity to uh, truly globalize Grant's brand. So we had relaunched a licensing program for Grant, which by the way, C-Rock is, he's a licensee. He was one of the licensees I retracted, uh, attracted. So, um, I mean, we, we, we 5X that, 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 that portfolio uh, through a pandemic. We, um, we did incredible business with him. I, I in turn got great profile and uh, our relationship matured. So, uh, so I, I definitely owe that that journey to Jared Glant uh, and no one else. What does uh, 10x mean to you? Talking about Grant Cardone. Uh, 10x is a standard. To me, it means uh, one that you live up to and through. What I don't like what 10x has become is 10x is like a, a bumper sticker. It's a, a wonderful vector image. It's it's an incredible avatar that somehow has you feel like you belong to a club. And by the way, that might feel good. But I believe I can only, in fact, present myself as a champion of the 10x standard if I'm living up to and through it, that I myself am a living standard, a living demonstration to that standard. So 10x to me is just it's, it's just a multiplier. The minute you hit a goal, 10x it. The minute you hit a goal, 10x it. The minute you get to that place, 10x it. The minute you get to that place, 10x it. So it's, it's the pusher. It's the accelerator. It's the amplifier. It's never a destination. 10x is not a destination. Thank you, Rich. How does someone go about raising billions of dollars for a project? Start. <laughs> Next question. Okay. No, but seriously, you start. Yeah. People yeah. are so intimidated by raising any money that they think that, how do I raise a billion? Start by raising a dollar. Right. Just start. Start with one dollar. I challenge anybody right now. You want to raise money? Go out there and ask for a buck. I don't care what you ask of them. I don't care what you say or promise. Get a dollar. Get one more dollar today than you had yesterday. And that's the start. That's the beginning. Most people don't start. I've, I've raised nearly $10 billion in assets over the 35 years of my career that's in the financial incredible. services business. And I got to tell you, man, it, it's, it's just something you've got to keep doing. It's something you got to keep at. It's something you got to stay on top of if you're committed to doing that. That's, that's incredible. Thank you, Rich. What type of coaching do you provide to financial advisors? And you mentioned this already. Can you summarize it in maybe 30 seconds or less? Financial advisors, wealth managers, um, you know, IAs, uh, you know, these guys are, are, are looking for three things I have experienced. One is they're looking to restore their relationship to the meaning of why they're building the practice. They, they want to restore their purpose in their practice. That number two is they're really looking to see how they can, in fact, really grow what they've got so they can sell it for more than it's worth. So there's a real growth curve that they really should, in fact, catalyze. And they can, given where demographics are. But third is, is they really want to make sure that this practice really becomes a real great extension of who they are and what their legacy shall be, rather than it just being a job, rather just being a role, rather just being a thing. So, so I coach, counsel, and advise a lot of financial planners and investment advisors to really, in fact, two, five, 10 X their practice so that we can really create an equitable exit. That's one to be proud of and one to look forward to. Um, and I implement all the things I've talked about today, uh, performance psychology, uh, our financial life philosophy, and, and a number of other really great tactics and technologies at my disposal. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate that. All right, Rich, we're going to move into what I call template questions. I ask that to everyone on here from you know, Dennis, Dr. Dennis Waitley to Les Brown, Mark Victor Hansen, everyone gets the same questions. Can mm -hmm. one book change the world? Maybe 30 seconds each question or less. Yes. You want me to name the book? Yeah, sure. The Bible. Start there. 
I mean, if you're a faithful person, then read your read your book of faith, whatever that faith might be. But start there. Start start with understanding the knowledge, the logic, and 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 the magic behind whatever it is you believe in. And you mentioned uh, a couple other big books earlier. Um, you said like in my yeah in my son's rich. yeah in my son's library for sure. There's a collection of books that that I I want to make sure that if I were to get hit by a truck today or in a hundred years from now, there's a collection of books that grow. And in there, some of the first books I put in there was definitely uh, Think and Grow Rich. The most the most recent book I just added in there was Atomic Habits. Um, so I'm always adding to his collection. So if I read a book and I feel it's a real moving one, I'll buy an extra copy and write in the book. I'll say, son, this is for you. This is what I learned and trust you will too. And I'll date it. So in his collection, when he hits that moment in his life, and he's hit it now, by the way, he's already started reading in those books because he's 15. So he's getting there now. Wow. He's reading books that I put aside for him when he just uh, when he was just first born. That is that is really really great of you to do that. You know, I came from my my parents. Uh, my I have four grandparents that died broke. I had no education. My parents barely got a high school education, so I didn't have anyone that, that blazed that trail. But knowing what we we know and to see you do that, that's that's incredible. And you're really helping him accelerating his life path. So, thank you. Um, Appreciate that. All right, Rich, uh, what role has networking played in your life? Maybe 30 seconds or less. Everything, man. We weren't born with a network or Rolodex. We, we don't have any numbers that were imprinted in our brain when we first arrived in this world. Everybody and everything is an extension of a successful conversation that served two people, you and them. And the way to really amplify that and accelerate it is networking, shaking hands, kissing babies, finding out what problems are in the world and what part of the solution you can provide. If you become a real excellent and extraordinary fireman, or fire lady, you're on the hunt for fires. You want to get addicted to fires and networking this really serves as the platform to that. Thank you, Rich. As an extension to that, is mentoring important? And who are some of your mentors? Mentoring is a non-negotiable. I mean, we all have been mentored, but we equally must be the mentor as well in your lifetime. So you'll be actually served as a mentor, a mentee, and you'll have to be a mentor, which I'm finding myself to be right now. So uh, everyone should be a mentor. Now, remember, mentors are sought not bought. They, they're, they're, they're people that are enrolled, not hired. They, they're not paid. You play together. And, and that's why mentors matter. Mentors are playing the game of you getting more in your life because you both equally win in life. That's different from coaches and trainers and others. Uh, a mentor is someone who really has madly fallen in love with the version of you they see in you. And uh, it's their job. They take it upon themselves to realize that with you. Thank you, Rich. Awesome question. Awesome response. Uh, what are your favorite financial books? You know, maybe uh, two or three. Mine. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and I mean it. I mean, I, I, I'm yeah. as a result of all the reading I've done and all the work I've done, all the people I've studied, all the people I've researched, I have the most exhaustive journal covering 30 years of financial intelligence. And I've got to say that I've always found something very misleading, very wrong, very disconnected in something, in someone. I mean, who came kind of close was definitely Robert Kiyosaki in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He came close. I will say that. He came close. I love his philosophy and his approach. And he's a very, very good man. Um, but for me, my work, I mean, my, the, the Invincible Investor was, was the first, um, my legacy. Um, my first book in that space was, was, was Wealth Mastery, which was the six essential shifts to a new financial destiny. I mean, and the reason why I say that is because that's the stuff that works in my life. I'm only interested in learning, teaching, and reading stuff that works. And the way I know it works is for you to show me how it worked for you. If you can't show me how it worked for you, then how is, how is it supposed to work for me? Yeah. So, so I want to make sure that whatever I'm reading and whatever I'm leading is always going to come from a place of having been done. Mm. So, so yes, my books. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Um, do we need money to survive? Yes. Is finance necessary for everyone? Why or why not? Yes, because if you don't under finance, it's like not understanding laws. Finance is the laws of money. If you don't understand and get yourself financially literate, you're not going to understand what some of the terms and distinctions in the world of getting your relationship right with money, with wealth, and with worth. Remember, folks, we're all wired to survive. And the number one thing you want to survive is more, more of all of it. But if you don't understand what it takes to create and produce more, then guess what? We're living paycheck to paycheck. And, and, and that's the problem that begins to have uh, people build debt, fall behind, have remorse, and even resentment. 
So, so yes, finance is important to learn and, and, and money is needed to buy things we need. Thank you, Rich. Excellent response. Uh, three more questions left. How important is having a purpose in business slash what is your purpose? Well, the purpose, as I said before, is created. And what it's created as is as a future. So the future that you have for yourself, like the future you in one, two, five, 10 years is the purpose. That's the purpose. The purpose is to realize that future. So whether in business or whether in life or, or whether in love or even relationship, you've got to always know that you're causing and creating what comes next, your purpose, also known as your future. So for me, my mission for the next five years is to go and cause and create 1,000 new millionaires by 2025. That's what I'm up to. That's the new game I'm playing. We just launched a very cool Rich Ladies Scholarship Initiative where I'm gifting a $10,000 seat in Rich U to take all of our program learning. Uh, it's a million dollar initiative that I've basically set aside to empower 100 women, human beings that identify as a woman so that they can get exactly the playbook, the people, the process, and the plan to really be an instrument for impact in their financial lives and the lives of others. So that's the kind of stuff I do that lights me up, being able to know that I'm gonna really source people to get to the next level in their experience of life. So um, that's, that's, that's my purpose. Thanks, Rich. And you kind of sneaked on to my next question. What, what would you plan, uh, what, what would you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so and why? I just want to continue honoring the gifts I've got. I want to be able to be a real great dad and continue to do so. I think every day that my son looks to me and wants to have a conversation is a day I won. Um, the day that he remains on the straight and narrow and remains humble and, and grateful and knows that he's a child of God is important to me. I mean, remaining happy is the key. Being married for 26 years is the key. I mean, doing what I do and continuing to do as I do it is, is all important to just honoring my existence. So for, for me, uh, I don't have goals and objectives because if I did, then it would mean that I needed to do something I'm not doing. I just think that my ultimate goal is to live the best life I can, period, full stop, because it could end tomorrow. It could end next week. It can end next month. And then what do my goals, ambitions, and aspirations got to say? Nothing, because they don't get a say. So I've got to live my time as if today is the only day I got. And as true as that is, and as much as we've heard it, I, as I get older, I realize this is so true. I've buried enough people of the past few years. I've seen people pass away so damn prematurely, whether by a sudden accident or just the, the, the stroke of bad luck, whatever the circumstances might be, every day is a gift. So live it to your fullest. So for me, I don't, I don't have a 10-year vision. I'm going to become the best version I can be of myself, and I'll prove it every single day. If 100 years pass and I'm still alive, then cumulatively, hopefully I've got as many followers as you do, and I've got as many viewers as you do, and I've got even... Uh, even more so because I've been at it every single day. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I love your message. It's, it's, it's a beautiful message. Um, and by the way, I've subscribed to the belief that you should be your first follower. <laughs> so the leader should always be the first follower. If not, the, the, the whole thing will fall like a stack, That's right. stack domino. So. That's right. Some of, some of my clients might sometimes say, well, I post my stuff. I don't like my own picture. Well, if you ain't going to like it, who is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What game are you playing, man? The numbers game or the liking game? If you want likes, <laughs> like your own stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. All right, L Rich, last question. What would you like to be your legacy to this world? Talk about legacy. I know you like this, this question. I, I think that the, I think legacy, and this is this is just an absolute uh, mantra for me. I, I am happy and proud to say that I've designed it and I've decided it and I've deciphered it. I believe that legacy is not measured by what you leave in terms of stuff like money like things, like shiny objects. That, that's not what legacy is. It's, it's not about an inheritance. It's not about the things you leave behind that everyone joyfully uh, sorts through and takes from you when you're gone. <laughs> legacy is defined by how you live, how you lead, how you love, and how you laugh. I mean, when you take how you live, plus how you lead, plus how you love, plus how you laugh, that determines and defines what you leave. And what you leave is your legacy. So the memory of you, the joy of being around you, the pleasure and profound honor of getting to know you, being connected to you. This is a part of your legacy. You now got a friend in me. And I know I got a friend in you. Thank That's you. legacy, man. This is what it's all about. So when people out there start saying, well, legacy is all hyped up, man, look at my brothers at the Lakers. When you look in the side of our ring, you know what it says? 
leave a legacy. They've adopted it themselves because how we play on the court is going to determine how we're remembered forever. People don't go Googling losers. They Google and watch winners and they watch because they want to emulate those people so that they can repeat those behaviors. So take this life very seriously because it's the only one we've got. That's legacy. Rich, I, I got to uh, just conclude and just say um, it's been an honor having you here today. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot from myself. I know we have so many people out there that will resonate with this. And, um, you know, I, I just want to turn the floor over to you for a moment. And you're, you're more than welcome to say whatever you, you'd like. If you want to showcase your next project, book, whatever, the floor is yours, Rich. Time is yours. Hey, man, look, I, first and foremost, I, like I said on the outset and many times through this conversation, it's not every day you get to have a real courageous conversation with a real person up to real things. So, so good on you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here, and I applaud your efforts for continuing this work that you're doing. So, so God bless you. I mean, number two, I definitely want to thank C-Rock for putting us in touch because, I mean, good people connect good people because we're up to good things. Uh, it's the most unselfish act you can ever perform by recommending people that you mean a lot to and vice versa. So, so my big shout out to C rock, but third for me, if, if folks want to get to know me a bit better, want to follow what I'm up to, uh, and understand more about what I am. I mean, they can go and visit me at my website, Richard Dolan, uh, com, And you'll see me before you'll see the UFO guy I promise. <laughs> and, uh, or you can follow me on Instagram and it's Richard dot Dolan and Dolan spelled D as in Delta O L A N. And, uh, either way you'll follow me just on my journey. I share pictures from time to time on who I'm connected with or what I'm up to. And, uh, and I mean, look, we do events. Uh, our events are very, very, very exclusive, not in terms of price, but in terms of size, uh, we believe in very impactful learning and impactful teaching, just as you and I both were taught back in our professor days where it's not the size of the class, but it's the size of the heart of the teacher teaching them. And, um, so we really love intimate events. Uh, we do them all the time in New York, uh, Miami, Los Angeles, uh, London, England, and of course, in Toronto, my hometown. And so uh, keep an eye, keep an eye, join our mailing list so you can get a sense of what we're doing. Uh, and there's even a free book. There's a, there's a book about my life, my life story, and the first technology I ever built on how to really get rich in the things that matter most you called Richology. That's right. I made it up, Richology. And that's a very cool philosophy. Go to my website. You can download it for free. Um, and it'll really go into a lot of great details. It'll recite a lot of things you and I talked about, Tony, but the best part is it's free. And um, if you just start there, then at least we can start building a relationship together. So that's that's my pledge. Um, that's my invitation. Thanks, Rich. And you mentioned in a podcast. I, I would have looked into it a little more. I couldn't find any information. What, what was uh, where's the website for that? Or yeah, if you go to richarddolan.com, you'll notice that uh, my podcasts are for our members. So we have a, a subscription service to what oh, we call yeah. Rich You. So in Rich You, one of the wonderful channels they have access to is this thing called Courageous Conversations. So. Um, where I interview one of my celebrity friends or, or professional athletes or someone up to something pretty major or epic. Um, I mean, just recently, I, I interviewed my dear friend who's the former 2018 Miss Ukraine, um, who just fled Ukraine with her son. I mean, what a fascinating story to hear from a friend of mine to find out from her perspective what's going on from the ground up. Wow. And uh, that's just an example of a story. And uh, we have NFL players and UFC players and, uh, I mean, actors, actresses, musicians, just, just a real delight. So I'll be sure to share with you the link. And uh, for those who follow me, I'm sure I can get you a link as well. All right. That's awesome. Thank you, Rich. Again, I want to thank you for being here, man. I look, I look forward to doing a lot of uh, amazing things with you. We got the clubhouse going in about uh, three weeks. So I think it was April, well, the Friday after April 1st, which would be April 8th. Uh, Rich is coming to Clubhouse on a Friday night stage between 6 p.m. to 7 to midnight Eastern time. Rich will be there between 7 and 9. That's the guest speaker window, okay? So if you want to see that, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time, Rich is going to be the main guest speaker. We always got a packed house, so come check that out. Um, other than that, thanks again, Rich. Appreciate appreciate you. And, um, folks, we're going we're gonna to conclude. So if you definitely follow, like, and subscribe to this podcast, to all Rich's social media as well. Um, you'll find the podcast on YouTube as well as my website. I'll post it, drfinance.info in the window. Okay. Um, so you've been watching the Dr. Finance Live podcast, Dr. Anthony Crenetti with Richard Dolan here, folks. And Rich, your, your website's name was again, the address? It's my name, Richard Dolan, D's and Delta, O-L-A-N.com. Dot com. Thank you. RichardDolan.com, folks. And uh, also don't forget to check out the th my three books, The Necessity of Finance. I wrote that about 10 years ago for my finance students. Um, also, then I had the most important lessons in economics and finance, about 218 principles. And then my, uh, my last conclusion book, The Survival of the Richest, 
where I had a lot of big, big, deep scientific arguments over 500 plus pages. Uh, check that out, folks. And um, I'm going to be posting this out to all the podcast directories too, so like Apple and et cetera. So definitely uh, check it out on there. Give it a like, a follow, a comment. Tell, tell us about what you think. You know, be nice. You can tell us whatever you, whatever you like. But uh, other than that, we'll see you on the next episode. We got Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank coming on next episode. So thanks again, Rich. Appreciate you. If, uh, if you, uh, you want to hang out in the green room, just a second, just I'll walk you out. But thanks again, folks. We'll see you next episode. Bye-bye now.